Do three people make up a panel? Okay. A panelette. <laughs> well, it's a half virtual and half in-person panel, the sum of which is a panel. <laughs> well, okay. That's right. That's right. You you certainly do. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not aware of any like side screens. Bring your laptop up here. Just bring your laptop up here. Yeah, I mean that's what that's what Matthias and I did. Yeah, yeah. Just bring your laptop. Yes, sir, John. <gasps> oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh my lord, look at that guy. Woo! Say that again? Are the slides from the presentation conversation? Yes, although maybe not immediately, but they will, they will be made later. Yep. Yep. Yeah, each of the tables is powered. There you go. Now you're talking. Yeah, I will. Okay. 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 <laughs> that would be kind of cool if you could, like, braille. <laughs> okay, folks, so you do not have to take your seats yet. We're still five minutes from starting. But uh, I wanted to, uh, along with my good friend and, and FPA co-chair, Matthias Steiner, welcome you to the opening session of the 20, spring 2022 uh, FPA plenary meeting. And um, so for those of you who were not here this morning, uh, how do you connect to the internet? Well, you navigate your way, your Wi-Fi to uh, the network called OuterNet. And then once you have found OuterNet, uh, you put in the passphrase, which consists of those four words, sure, funny, trade, father, with spaces between each of them in lowercase. And if you've ever used OuterNet before and you find that your system says that's not the right password, it's probably because you have one from before this week cached on your system. And so you're going to need to forget the network and then rejoin the network to get on. And if you, if that all sounds too complicated, then there is a guest wireless and there are instructions on the wall over there on how to connect. And I never connected. So point number two I wanted to bring up is that this room is mic'd. And if you have your mic hot or even your speaker hot, we get wonderful echoes and feedback, feedback, feedback in this room. So uh, do take a look at your stuff and make sure it's all in the off position. Um, you guys have your, your mics up there to talk with, so you're good. And maybe that was it. <laughs> can, can you, no, I, uh, so it's a push to talk. Yeah, so try that out, Ralph. Can you hear me? Testing? One, well, two, you don't need a mic, but yes, we can hear you. <laughs> You want me to turn these on and off, or? Uh, I thought, well, well, let me say this. When we were, when Matthias and I were up earlier, I had mine on the whole time, and I didn't think I was causing problems. But folks online, uh, am I deluding myself? Was I causing problems? <laughs> that means we'll, we'll turn it off when we're not talking. Yeah, it sounds like probably the correct procedure is to turn it on and off. Yes. I don't I don't think that I, I tried using that mute button and I couldn't seem to get it to work. So just turn the speak on and off. Um, bathrooms. Uh, back of the room. Ladies room is in the right hall. Men's room is in the left hall. Come on, baby. I know you can work. Oh, sorry. Went too fast. Um, 
it's just about too late if you're hungry because we're about ready to get started. But at it, literally at any point in time this afternoon, because as you're going to see, our schedule is extraordinarily compressed, especially with Gary's session. Um, if you want to go get a cup of coffee or if you want to go use the facilities, just just get yourself up and, and, and head out there. If you smell smoke and nobody's smoking in the room, head out those doors here on the stage side of the room until you no longer smell smoke. No. <laughs> no. Sir. Oh, so uh, what if one wanted a cup of coffee? So if one wants a cup of coffee, the next 30 minutes is apparently the time to do it. Thank you, sir. We have the, is that the old Starbucks. So, OK, so so there is a coffee place open beyond 130. But for those who need escorting, you'll need to be escorted. So Bob has volunteered to escort everybody up to get coffee whenever they need it. <laughs> uh, OK. What else? Oh yeah, and then there was that one. It's the the, the and do we, do we? Oh, there are yeah. Sorry, good good point, John. Thank you. There are um, there are hand mics on these two rows. Let's put one on Mike Robinson's row because he's always wanting to say stuff too. And plus, they have a lot of people on that row. Um, and then uh, front row will run stuff uh, to and from you uh, as need be. But we have basically a, a mic now on the end of every row, and so. Um, Frank, you got one over there. You're in charge of it. Um, ooh. Now that's space weather, not low level weather. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, I clearly have been hitting this button without knowing it. Uh, okay, yeah. So hot room. Make sure you've muted your mics and mute your speaker. I forgot about that this morning and, and was through other sources picking up stuff coming out of my laptop speaker. Um, it's one, no, shoot, we haven't had, a, we haven't had an on-time departure yet. Do you realize that? Why is that? That's because I've been up here yakking. <laughs> so, you're on time. Keep in mind, airlines say that if you take off within 10 minutes of your takeoff time, you're on time. Yeah, well, it's five, actually. and, and uh, Remember that? Remember D0, D5? Yes, you do. Bill Nichols, are you on right now? Mm. Uh, so everybody have their, their mics and speakers muted, right? I probably don't. It's probably on my laptop. All right. Without any further ado, let me hand it over to uh, Ralph Stoffler and his distinguished in-person and virtual panel, and I will say no more. Ralph, over to you, I'll drive. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here today. It's great to see a lot of folks in person again. I know there's still a lot of people online. So you're gonna, you're gonna get some feedback today on low level weather from a diverse group. Some of us are operational meteorologists, some of us are aviators, some of us have been in the FAA, We've got private industry uh, uh, focus, and uh, we also spend a lot of time in DOD. So I, I think an excellent panel that covers a wide breadth. Okay, I find What's the bottom line I want to be able to get, get over to you here? From a meteorological standpoint, the United States of America, without question, has one of the densest weather reporting networks in the world. When you look at the Aviation Weather Center capabilities with all the sensors oh, we have, the radars and all the capabilities that are out there, uh, you would tend to think we have them covered. At the end of this briefing, you're going to realize there's a lot of gaps, a lot of things that we still need to do. And I think part of the message here is yeah. only 3% of the continental United States is actually covered by AWAS sensors. And a lot of the NEXRAD capability doesn't cover the low altitude weather capabilities because it looks far too high up. So, Ralph, speak into your mic, please, sir. Wow, this is the first time I've heard that uh, people can't hear me, but I can certainly uh, speak louder. Uh, usually I always speak too loud. So we're going to start off, and, and the way I want to be able to do this, uh, we didn't want to kill you with death by PowerPoint. So we're going to have each presenter talk to their slide or slides uh, for five or six minutes or so. Uh, then we'll have the panel uh, 
you know, add in another perspective beyond just what the briefer said. And then I want to have the opportunity for, for you all to engage, maybe to ask two or three questions on that particular subject. I will do the best I can to keep us on time, uh, to make our takeoff and landing times. And uh, if necessary, I'll use some headwind uh, or tailwind as necessary to keep us on schedule. So hopefully that'll work out. So let's get started here. Kevin Johnson, are you on the line? I am, Ralph. I am, Ralph. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, uh, and uh, when you're ready, just say next slide, and let's please let's go to the. This gives well, you before the we get to the next slide, I don't know who's driving the slides, but let's go. Back all all you have to do is say next, and the slides will automatically uh, go on. Okay. Well, I want to go back. I want to go back to your first slide because I want to see if anybody thinks we need to cancel you on on your picks of selection of pictures. I mean, does that look like low level weather? Low altitude weather? I, I don't know, just kind of looks like it's pretty high level to me. But that's just Have you ever flown over a low stratus deck at 500 feet? Yeah, yeah, I can't say it really looked like that, but whatever. You know, this, this, this is what happens. I'm giving you a hard time, Ralph. This, this is what happens when, um, when, when two folks who have uh, served in the same branch of the military in various positions get out afterwards, and then one can give the other one crap because it doesn't make any difference anymore. All right, well, I just wanted to Actually, see. Actually, it, it didn't make a difference when we were in the branch either, just so you know. All right, next slide. All right, well, I actually uh, Google blow altitude weather and didn't see a definition. And I thought we would uh, start this panel with a definition of what low altitude weather is. Uh, and then I'm going to talk, uh, you know, basically how we measure it today, how we analyze it and forecast low altitude weather. So I'll focus in on the weather. And then Gordy Rother from Flight Standards is going to talk more of a uh, you know, where the FA comes from a policy standpoint and the use of this weather information uh, for operations. So here's a definition, just, just weather, temperature, dew point, wind direction, speed, moisture, precip, and pressure that is strongly influenced by interaction with the surface of the earth. And it'll adjust to those uh, forcing functions from the surface uh, within a time scale of an hour or less. So pretty oh, darn micro scale. Uh, you helped me a few weeks so ago with my iPhone. Any, any comments and or questions on this I, definition? I, I have a problem and I better than. I'm hearing some background. Okay, that's gone. Okay, lots of slides. All right, next slide. So here's just uh, some some examples of the current sensing uh, capabilities for low altitude weather. So uh, for ground based in situ observations, we have your basic surface observations, the gold standard being the ASOS and AWOS. Also have the meso nets within the states. And of course, other third party um, surface observations that have varying quality. Uh, also, ground based remote observations, your radar, lightning, webcams, and uh, Don added the New York State Mesonet uh, capability there with the wind and radiometric profilers. And we also have your airborne in situ observations, the Ray Wind Sound and aircraft observations and satellite based observations as well. Next slide. And then for analysis and forecast capabilities of low altitude weather, we've got the real time mesoscale analysis, multi radar, multi sensor uh, analysis, proprietary third party analysis supporting aviation clients are out there. Your weather service watches and warnings, the TAFs, uh, localized aviation MOS program, 
graphical forecasts for aviation. That's the point and click capability that we've been working with the weather service on uh, to field various aviation weather hazard guidance products, numerical weather predictions, and also other proprietary third party uh, products supporting aviation clients. So again, just wanted to touch on the various uh, capabilities that exist today for low altitude weather. Gordy, are you on? You're going to talk to the policy for, from sure. a flight standards perspective. Sure. Can you hear me, Kevin? Yep. OK, perfect. Uh, next slide. So uh, what are we doing here? Um, we're working with uh, ASTM F38 Weather Standards Group, Don and Ralph and, and others. Um, and we are looking at developing, you know, uh, basically standards. And the standards are going to be uh, tiered, or the, the notion is we'll have uh, different tiers of weather information. Um, so the basic, uh, the base standard would be uh, based on FMH1, AWAS, ASOS guidance. So we're, we're kind of uh, drawing that all out right now, um, you know, putting it into a spreadsheet, trying to figure out what you know what makes sense the you know the, the different um, acceptable tiers um, the probability of detection or uh, confidence levels that are going to be necessary for for uh, what we have currently and then expanding out from that in a different uh, into a tier two and a tier three uh, type environment um, <clears throat> this would allow for analysis type data versus certified sensor data i know that uh, others on this uh, uh, fpa team have have been Frustrated in years past with uh, uh, the FAA and their uh, rigidness to, um, you know, approve other uh, other weather sensors or other, um, um, you know, weather uh, analysis tools. So this basically is going to open the door for that, um, and you know, we're going to be kind of expanding our scope here a bit and looking at, uh, like like Kevin showed, what's what's available today, uh, and then trying to to. Uh, uh, grab a an acceptable level of risk, if you will, um, in into the different tiers. So um, we're just we're just hashing this out right now with uh, with uh, Ralph and and um, and Don, and uh, we feel this is the way forward. So operationally, we haven't really defined yet based on the different um, you know UAS types of operations the, the higher risk versus the lower risk as far as what's acceptable um, you know as far as tier weather for those types of operations we feel that'll all kind of flow out uh, once we identify all the different um, weather elements you know so if the back to Kevin's I think second slide or first slide he he kind of covered that low altitude weather information right so we're looking at those basic elements that are necessary for you know aviation to make the de operational decisions whether they should fly or they shouldn't fly but then keeping our vision open to you know what other um since many of these uh vehicles are um i, I would use the term not all weather but uh, you know um definitely more sensitive to uh different weather um uh, events uh you know we'll have to we'll have to expand uh that table you know based on on you know, let's for example, uh, lightning or or um, convection, those those types of things. So or or rain intensity. So that's um, that's what we feel will kind of shake out uh, as this evolves over time. So that's the basic notion. Um, we think we got some pr pretty good support uh, so far with uh, that direction. So um, I guess I'll turn it back to you, Kevin, to wrap this up. No, I think that's a good Is intro, Gordy. Okay. I think it's over to Don now. Okay. No, no, we're not over to Don yet. Don's the next subject. This is the part where the rest of us uh, get to ask some questions and add uh, our own mustard uh, to the discussion. Oh, okay. Oh, All okay. right. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead, Rob. Okay. Flexibility is key here, about it. <laughs> so, you know, I, at least from my perspective, what you heard here is is a is a description of all the different capabilities that we have out there. And it certainly sounds like there's a lot of data. But if you look at the uh, the slide where we talk about LEO satellites, for example, there is a significant amount of remote sensing that takes place uh, on the on the behalf of NOAA. A lot of that remote sensing data, frankly, we don't use very effectively in the aviation weather business. 
We're very focused on certified sensors, uh, AWOS. Uh, that's what the FAA is going to. So all that satellite data, a lot of the radar data, all that situational awareness data isn't being effectively used. And then the other thing that we really need to work on is we're providing all that data and we're handing it off to a pilot to decide what he or she is going to do with it. So we really need to, uh, you know, take the all the available data and and compress it in such a way where we're handing off your VFR or your not VFR. That way, the aviator doesn't necessarily have to make all those decisions. At least that's my perspective. Uh, we did a lot of that kind of work in the Air Force. Uh, you heard that debate earlier today where, you know, uh, if you're in an, in an airplane, there's a lot of things going on and weather is just one of many. And sometimes it's it's more focused on can I fly or not? Because I don't want to have to worry about all those details or go through a litany of 40,000 different products uh, in order to decide whether I can go or not. So that would be my take. Um, anybody else in the panel uh, that would like to comment on that before we open this up to questions to the group? Well, Ralph, I, I just want to add that, you know, the one thing we've got to try to wrap our heads around is the pilot is not on the airframe when they're flying drones. And losing the pilot on, in the cockpit is losing the best weather sensor we've ever had. Uh, you know, we've, we've been able to get away with less granular products uh, because the pilot has always been responsible for getting out of the mess. And in the future, we're putting a responsibility on a pilot that is not even in the cockpit to validate and verify the weather they're flying in, which is not really possible today because our data and our coverage is subgrid to what they need. Is uh, and we and we really have to recognize that replicating that is not going to be easy. Uh, but in all effect, if you're flying ten miles BB loss through terrain and through areas where there's valleys and mountains and hills, you're flying blind because pilots aren't going to be looking at the weather when they're flying. And even if they could do a soda straw a video, it's not going to be effective. And the other thing is, is within a year, we'll probably be seeing one pilot flying many drones at one time. So the pilot effectively is a lost sensor, and we've got to fill the gaps that, that are out there today, purely because of the situational awareness that, that's going to get lost. Fully concur with that. And uh, I think that's a, it's a very big thing, because if you look at FAA policy today, they trust the certified sensor of an AWOS or the certified sensor of a human eyeball. Those are those are the two criteria that uh, we're looking at, and we're going to lose one of the most important sensors we have. You know, and then if you go back to the fact that three percent of the CONUS is covered by AWOS, the rest of it is covered by certified human eyeballs. And if we take that out of the equation, that is a huge gap that we absolutely have to fill. And that's something that uh, a variety of agencies are looking at, and and obviously to try to fill it with our existing capabilities is formidably expensive. If you do simple math uh, and believe that each AWAS covers five nautical miles, uh, you would spend about $8 billion just to put AWASs across the US to be able to provide the kind of coverage uh, that we need. All right, anybody else on the panel want to comment? I, I just, I, I, I noticed there's somebody that has their hand up, but. Uh, this is Gordy, and I I wanted to make sure that I supported exactly what Don was saying. When you remove those five senses from the cockpit, the cockpit, you are removing a big safety net, an absolutely huge safety net. So the timeliness of the information, um, the alerting of the information is going to be key to how the how you can maintain what we in the FAA, we use the term equivalent level of safety. Anytime we do an exemption, we're always looking for the equivalent level of safety. It's required. Well, that's a difficult, that's a tall order. Um, and to your point, Ralph, on the um, filling the NAS with um, enough AWOS or ASOS to, to cover it necessarily, uh, I, I think there's a strong argument to be made that, that uh, five miles is, well, it's probably too far. Uh, it's a bridge too far. Even in a lot of areas where you may have an AWOS and and the airport's on a on a plateau and the the valley is in a town or some the towns in a valley below, um, 
the town might be within the five mile radius, but the uh, accuracy of that weather information is is highly suspect. So anyway, um, I, I guess these are some points I just wanted to uh, agree with you, point out, and uh, uh, that's that's my opinion. Anyway, I don't know. Um, I guess Matt, you're going to call on people from here, or or is that? Um, is, no, we got it. Okay, perfect. Okay, perfect. Hi, Gordy, it's Marilyn. Um, I have to mirror what Don and Gordy have just said. And when I worked for the FAA for a short 24 years, uh, before I left, I wrote the waivers and exemptions. And as a pilot, I would ask the operators of these BV loss operations, what weather are you using to meet the requirements? And I would get various answers. And one thing that I'd like to point out, most of these individuals operating the remote pilot certificate operators were not pilots. They were people with a remote pilot certificate for a small UAS. It's someone who took a written exam and did not perform anything to the satisfaction or any sort of qualification criteria the way a designated pilot examiner would examine a candidate who is actually flying. So not only did I never see anyone fly whatever drone they were flying, I had no idea who these people were except for a piece of paper. And when I said, what are you using to qualify your weather, I would get various responses and most often it would be a METAR. Oh, okay, great. Where is the METAR? How far is it? Oh, um, it's at such and such an airport. That's about 50 miles away. And I thought, well, that's that's excellent. That's perfect for your two-mile flight, 50 miles from the METAR. And I say that rather sarcastically. But the problem was that these waivers went out of agency because I didn't have an effective voice to make them stop. And exemptions the same way. Now, as far as exemptions, anything over 55 pounds that wasn't part 107 needed an exemption. So now we're writing exemptions to allow into either upper airspace above 400 feet or faster or heavier. And the same problem, people who are not necessarily pilots, aviators operating in the NAS, not knowing what weather they needed or where to get it. And I could go on, but I'll get off my soapbox. Okay, you've heard the panel perspective. Let's go to the uh, to the crowd. You had a question? Can we get him uh, a microphone, please? Coming down the aisle, and, and uh, uh, Ralph, uh, Walt Rogers online has his hand up wishing to speak also. So if you can move, work him in, please. Okay, my question was, I sort of brought up earlier as a future F, Paul, when I've heard this, um, you know, performance-based data. I haven't really seen that there's a candidate list of data, where which data, because we know there's all sorts of sources out there. People walk around with ping on their phones. That can be a source of that's useful information, but you don't know the quality. You can have an anometer in somebody's backyard, but you don't always know where it's placed and its quality. You know how accurate it's reflective of a given area, depending on what it's sensing. Is seasonal, it depends on the architecture around it, all these other things. So from performance based, has there been, because I kind of viewed it as a chicken and the egg, I understand the need for the standards, but I think you also, I haven't really heard that they've identified Hi. The, data, the specific data. So that was really where my question is. The Level data, right now, you can please leave a message. Thank you. Bye. Okay, nobody's home. I guess I'll call back. <laughs> but that was really my question is really is, has there been, have they started to identify in this performance-based standard, the group of data that's needed and how much of it to identify what sources or how, how they're going to go about verifying the performance of the data if it's coming from a source that's not a standard source. And we know that data can provide use. We've seen that on WIDIC. There's a lot of utility out there, but you have to know its quality or some means of showing that it performs at a level. And you don't always have this real sensor next to it as a gold standard. So you are 100% correct in everything you said. We have begun that work. It is very challenging. Uh, in the draft standards we put together so far, uh, as you've already heard, we start off with the AWAS standards as being tier one. Uh, and so, and then we're gonna go on to a next set of sensors, which are almost as good as AWAS. 
and then you move on to tier three, which includes other sensors and non-traditional sources of weather information. Uh, and you know what we want to be able to do is say, if you're going to fly a high risk mission, then you're going to have to have AWOS type quality. Uh, and if perhaps you're just out checking pipelines in a very unpopulated rural area, then using tier three type data, which could be different sensors or remote sense data could be something you could leverage. So that's kind of the approach right now, a combination of different tiers uh, and, uh, and- So you're not pace. trying to bring tier three data up in quality through other algorithms like crowdsourcing and other things where you match dissimilar or you can show if it's within a certain number from an ASOS based on historical data, it's probably accurate and things like that. So you're just gonna say, hey, this data, you'll just tag it as low, re low quality or low reliability. No, yeah, let me, yeah, let me, yeah. Don, you uh, let, me jump in. let me jump in, Rob. Yeah, so the answer is you can't, there's data, there's probably sensors out there today that are even more accurate than some of the ASOS da data. Um, I mean, the sensors, te sensor technology has gotten amazingly good, right? And I think the, the challenge is really more about reliability of the data, not more than the quality of the sensors that are out there. I think you can and you should be able to fleet up to a tier one, yes. And, and, and so the idea here is that we will, you know, work. This is not a project that's going to take, you know, two months, right? We recognize everything you said is spot on. And there's going to be a process we're going to go through. The first thing is we want to recognize that all data is a player. And we and to name all those data sets right now is impossible because we don't even know what they all are right now. We don't know what they're going to be two years from now. So what we want to do is keep that kind of open, right, to where somebody and I'm just, you know, all I'm doing here is 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 thinking about what the possibilities are, not that we have a solution yet. But the idea here is this, if you turn your data in and, and you can turn it into a third party provider that can validate the goodness of that data against some standard that's available, some standard data set that's available that can prove that that data is meeting a certain level of quality and reliability, then that data should be qualified to be stamped, metadata, and put onto a discoverable platform for use by um, anybody who is going to use that data for flight operations. And that data will also come with a quality standard that will also say, tell the operator what's the error rate, and then they can make a risk-based decision based on the flight they're taking and the risk they're taking on whether or not they they can or should use that data set in their decision making. So that's really where what we're trying to get to. And it's going to require a change in paradigm, obviously. It's going to require systems and research. We're going to need research, right? Which is why I want to drive home the point that there's a lot of research that we need to do in order to implement this, right? Um, it gets down to how do you quantify the goodness of a data set? Um, you know, how do you make it so it's agile and easy to do if the data is available? If we have a, a scanning wind LIDAR that's operating in an area that covers 20 kilometer area up to 6,000 feet, and somebody wants to fly a drone through it in a drone sensor and turn that data in, and we can validate it against a, a good benchmark data set, can we say that that data then has met a certain standard and stamp it with a metadata? You know, these are kinds of things that I want, we have to just open our mind, right, about how this could happen. And, and the how is gonna come after we kind of define the what, I think, and it's gonna require research. Okay, so good answer, Don. Uh, let's go to the question we had online. So uh, it's actually Walt Rogers with his hand up. Walt, if you wanna unmute and ask your question, please feel free. Sure. Sure, sure, fine, thanks. Uh, my question has been partially answered. Uh, my question was to the FAA Standards Group for certification. Are you planning on certifying these remote sensors? And you partially answered that as this tier three data, but I'm gonna modify the question a bit. Uh, would Are you making plans to certify the generic remote sensors that are well-established, such as NEXRAD and uh, the GOES uh, or satellite imagery for as a remote observation. I think Kevin would say certification is not the word they want to use, right, Kevin? It's quantifying the quality of the data, correct? And then assigning a, a tier level to that based on the quality and the act and the error rates of that data. Is that do I have that right, right Kevin? Yeah, we want to get away from certifying and move towards qualifying. You're right, Don. That, that makes a lot of sense, Kevin. Uh, it's a lot easier to do. 
well, not a lot easier to do, but easier to do. Well, it, it, <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it was, not a lot. I think, I think it, the, the more you crowdsource good data and the more you start quantifying good data, you get more examples than to run against, right? And so it becomes easier to do it because you don't have to send it to, you know, Dulles to have some, uh, you know, team out there, you know, certify instruments. You'll have a lot of data to compare against. And it kind of will just kind of expand itself and become – you know, more and more effective over time. Okay, we have time for one more question before we move on. Please go ahead. Yeah, this is Tom Fahey coming back from a, a, a break for a few years in retirement. Uh, I had a question for any of uh, the uh, part 121 operators, commercial passenger, and also the FAA. I know there'd been cases in the past when um, data was missing and uh, what part 121 operators had to cancel flights. Is that still an issue? If anyone uh, from yes. uh, operators you want the are short on? answer? Yeah, who, who's that speaking? This is Gordy Rolter. Yes, it's still okay. an issue. <laughs> yes, it's still an issue and yes, we're we're trying to fill the gaps uh, with RTMA, and we uh, working with the EMC folks to. Um, well, basically, they've they've done a validation uh, work for us for the past uh, couple three years now, and uh, we're we're trying to again quantify that, and that you know that may fall into tier one, it may fall into tier two or tier three. You know, quite quite honestly, well, there's levels of mitigation that can be put against some of the data. I, I say some wind is going to be a very difficult one, right? So when you got wind, you can do a little bit of mitigation, but still, you know, it's when you start getting to the limits of the vehicle, you're going to want to know. Um, so, yeah. So, short answer is yes, that's still an issue. Uh, it yeah. will be an issue today, moving forward into the future. We're hopeful we can we can kind of bridge that gap with some of the analysis uh, uh, tools that the the weather service uh, can provide us, uh, and then in the future, a what they call 3D RTMA. So, hopefully, hey, hey Tom, it's answer. Kevin. Well, welcome back. Um, and, and Gordy's right; it's still an issue. But I, I, I don't remember before you retired. Did we have temperature in place where you could use RTMA as as a sub if if temperature was missing from the ASOS? I think it was just getting ready to cut over. <laughs> Yeah, I guess it's been what five years or so. Yeah, yeah, it's been. Five. So yeah, we worked with flight standards to 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 do that, and and that was a big win. But like Gordy said, we're looking at other elements within our TMA. Yeah. Well, thanks to uh, y'all there at the FAA for working on that. Appreciate okay. it. Let's try and squeeze in YouTube, Bill. Can I try that again? There we go. On certified versus accuracy and tier three data. So I have my backyard weather station, like Gary mentioned. I'm four miles west of Dulles, and it's 20 feet high, my anemometer, but there's a crepe myrtle close by, so it blocks it a little bit. But when I look at the quality control of my weather station against Dulles and other surrounding weather stations, temperature, pressure, moisture, it's all good. The winds are always off. Well the winds measured where they are are not off they're correct they don't match dulles and i look at other weather stations around where i live and they're pretty close to mine because there's houses and trees and whatnot so if i'm getting pizza delivered at my house by a drone i want that to know my winds in my neighborhood not dulles which has stronger winds almost all the time because it's asos and in the open so my point is are we going to be looking at certifying weather stations tier three to asos's or are we really going to do a better QC and quality control of the surrounding area, which I think would be more valid than comparing to an ASOS or AWOS? No, we're not. We're definitely not. We're going to qualify this data and certify the system. Kevin, say that again. I think I stepped over, Ralph. Uh, we're uh, we're not. Yeah, we're not going to certify the systems, Bill. We're going to qualify the data. We're going to have a confidence level 
um, that you know, makes more based, sense. Yeah. So it, it the the um, the million dollar question is is how we're going to validate that. But to what Don was saying, once you have larger and larger data sets to compare things to, it's going to be a bit easier. I'm, I'm staying a bit easier to to have some level of of validation. Because to your point exactly, you know, we've we've discussed this. You you make the, the point very well that, you know, if if I'm going to operate a drone near your house, I would definitely want to use your winds versus the winds over at Dulles. So, um, and, and there's, and I don't want to be limited by someone in the FAA saying, well, that's not a certified sensor, right? Um, it it that doesn't that doesn't make sense. However, the flip side of that. Right is always well. How good is it? And is there, to Gary's point, that big data piece that that we use the term crowdsourcing, but that that data sourcing um, notion where you can gather other information and say it's pretty close and it's pretty close eighty eighty percent of the time. Henceforth, stamped you know tier three data. Okay, great. So uh, let's move on to the next subject, and uh, we're going to talk about local influences on low altitude weather. Uh, Don's going to address that, and you know my intro piece to that is, and this is very important. We just talked about model data, okay? Model data and real data are definitely not the same. Uh, and uh, you know, to go back to my uh, NATO discussion earlier, when I was in Europe back in the Dark Ages, uh, we started building sensors in many places uh, for military needs. And because the sensors didn't collect everything we needed, some of the data was replaced by model data. And pretty soon there was a very good correlation between model output and the sensors. And uh, you can probably guess why. So the bottom line is there's a lot of local influences that models do not address, don't cover, and we need to understand those. Don, over to you. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm gonna give you back some time here, Ralph, because I know you're you're running behind, but. A couple of things I just want to say. First of all, Bill's, Bill's um, insight, it was so spot on. So, you know, I've been working for four years now with the operators. We were up in New Air. We fly with them. We understand all these local challenges. Um, you know, I, I come from a background of being uh, on Air Force bases. Uh, I remember back in Kunsan, back in 2000, in, uh, the first day I walked on Kunsan in 1991, the wing commander was waiting for me and I was still in civilian clothes and he said, who are you? And I said, I'm the new guy coming here. Well, I'm just telling you right now, I want you to get this weather observing problem fixed. I'm tired. I'm tired of my aircraft coming in on the approach end of the runway and not seeing the runway, but your observer calling seven miles visibility. And he said, if you don't fix this problem, I'm going to put you in a boat at the end of the runway to take your own weather observations. So what's the moral of that story? I, I always get the question from people, how good is the ASOS? How far does it, you know, how large of an area does it cover? And the answer is it, it doesn't, we don't know. It depends on the climate. It depends on the day of the week, the, the weather regime that's uh, impacting things. And one of the things that really we have to get our head around is we're, as a pristine science, we are actually using some big fallacies in how we make decisions and using weather information. The pilots themselves, don't even understand these fallacies, which is a little dangerous because they think that, you know, we tell them use the nearest METAR and they go, okay, I use the nearest METAR, I'm good. When there's a really good chance that maybe that METAR is not relevant for where they are. And this is where all the natural low micro weather pieces come into play. Uh, and all these areas, we do not have a way to measure Ventura winds in Manhattan around the heliports. You know, we have a wind sock in some places. That's not three-dimensional winds. We don't know what those winds are doing as that helicopter's coming in. We're telling people they need surface observation. That's probably the least important thing they need because if they can get through the swirling winds in the buildings, they'll probably gonna be able to land okay if they can get through that. So we've got to start really thinking about a whole paradigm about how we're communicating weather information, what we think is good today, right? I would maintain that Bill's observation is a hell of a lot better than the Dulles observation. Uh, at his home, even if it has the crate myrtle nearby. Um, and that gets back to the other problem that he brought up. If you ever look at the Mavis observations and you look at places where there's weather sensors, 
um, frequently the winds will always be under uh, less, less blowing less than they are at the airports. And people look at that and go, oh, those weather stations, they, they are not very accurate. Well, no, those weather stations are probably pretty accurate. They're just not sitting in a, a five mile open field, right? They're actually in a neighborhood where there's trees. So I think, you know, we have to think about the whole paradigm because we're not landing aircraft at airfields. Drones don't fly at airports, mostly. Uh, they fly everywhere else, ubiquitously, where there's no data. And they have to deal with things like, very localized fog in Stratus when they're supposed to be in VFR and they don't even know they're flying in IFR because there's no product that tells them they're in IFR, right? Blissfully ignorant, updrafts and downdrafts. I've seen fixed wing drones get pulled four or 500 feet uh, vertically from, a, from an updraft or a downdraft, right? They're talking about stacking uh, airspace management and having two or three levels of drones on top of each other and I, I kind of bring up to them, look, you don't even, we don't even have a forecast for updrafts and downdrafts. Say, how are you going to manage the volume reservation for that drone, for those drones, and make sure they're not going to run into each other on a day where there's strong updrafts? So these are this local, this local weather is not picked up by our current weather measurements. It's especially our in situ. It's not picked up by the models in a lot of cases. Some cases it is, but some cases it's not. And it's um, definitely not available to an end user in a way that they can use it. And if they're not in the aircraft and they're sitting in a bunker somewhere flying 10 miles, if you don't communicate that information, they're flying blind. Now, you know, there's risk everywhere. We're not going to solve all these problems, which is why we got to take some risk in our belief that we have to use crowdsourcing for weather data. And we've got to figure out how to solve the problems that you're bringing up here on how to quantify it. And remember, we're also talking about risk-based decisions by pilots. So if they're flying a pizza over Kansas, they will have a checklist to go through based on the risk of that mission that will allow them to use less accurate data. As long as they know what the error rate is, they will be allowed to use it because the ground risk is lower. Remember, everything that a pilot, every decision is made is based on ground risk or air to air, right? And so, they will be able to use other data sets. Just because it's not climate quality, pristine ASOS data that goes into a model, doesn't mean they won't be able to use it. We've got to work on quantifying that. We've got to work at making their job easier to understand what it is and how good it is so we can pick up some of these microclimates and get that information out to them. So that's, that's basically all I wanted to say on this uh, slide, Ralph. Okay. Uh Good coverage. Um, does anybody on the panel want to add on to uh, what Don just talked about? Any perspectives from the FAA on that, Kevin or Gordy? I just think that Don's, think that Don's uh, spot, spot, on. spot on. Okay. Anybody here? Okay, so I've already uh, given you my spiel on uh, I'm a big believer in uh, local effects. Uh, you know, you, most of you probably realize that National Weather Service has gone down the path where many TAFs are automated, uh, and uh, automation has its flaws. Uh, and without understanding local effects and what that means to the mission set or to the type of aircraft you're flying, uh, that's where I see that the human overwatch or the human in the loop can really make a big difference for aviation weather. So that's been that's been my focus, uh, and that's also one of the reasons that we changed procedures in the Air Force uh, as my last part of my career. So Ralph, anybody, Ralph. yeah, go ahead. Dave Kochevar has got, got a comment. Okay, please go ahead. Hey, thanks, thanks, Gordy and Don. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I just just wanted to comment about what 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 Don just mentioned regarding um, automation in our tasks. Um, just want to provide some clarity on that. We we do have some automation. Oh, that was Ralph. That was Ralph. In case it's in case you're going to shoot an arrow, it was Ralph. Oh, I'm I'm it. sorry. I, yeah, I'm yeah. Just, <laughs> apologize for that. Um, I just wanted to provide some maybe some clarity on on what we're doing and how we we do have some automation that that helps to create say the first draft of the TAF. But none of the tasks that you're seeing are created in a fully automated form, at least a what, what we would call a, a certified 
half from what you know what you would normally think. Um, we do have some products up here, like um, the Alaska Aviation Guidance in Alaska, that are a fully automated, you know, TAF-like guidance. Um, but you know, our our official TAFs are still, um, in the end, human QC and human uh, created and written. Yeah, so Dave, I just want to say, um, I, I, you know, I don't want to get wrapped up on the TAF discussion in this because TAFs are really not relevant to drones and air flying in places where there's no airfield, right? So it's really a issue. I mean, it doesn't matter how good the TAF is at the airfield, right? It's still not relevant to areas away from the airfield. So we want to make sure we don't stay locked into that TAF concept. We've got to come up with another way to think about how we produce products for end users that are ubiquitous and covers where they are and where, what they care about at the point they care about and where they're flying. Um, and so, I mean, that, that's really, I think, the main I would take away from the whole TAF conversation. I, by the way, very strongly uh, that forecasters in aviation weather, especially in this industry, are going to have to still be involved in the process. Anybody who thinks they're going to automate uh, this process with micro weather and all the other challenges, um, they just don't really understand, you know, what, how good the models are today, or they really don't understand what the real challenges are in a go, no go decision. These uh, drones, they're going to fly 10 miles, 15 miles beyond site. If the wind speed at 200 feet is five knots stronger than forecasted, and I'm talking like, you know, 12 knots, 18 knots, or 17 knots, they may not be able to finish the flight. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to crash the drone. It means that they'll have to terminate and come back or they'll have to land it, right? But we're not talking about big weather margins here. You know, five knots is in the margin of error in a TAF, really, right? But it's not in the margin of error for a drone flying at 200 feet. It's it's a difference between making that mission happen or not. So I think that's, you know, that's what we got to be focusing on is how are we going to meet that requirement, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think in particular, if in Alaska, this is, is you know, due, due to projects like AAG, we're we're pretty familiar with this, where we we already have this second standard that that was, um, you know, spoke about earlier with this this kind of three tiered approach to to weather data, both forecast knobs, um, where yeah, we're we're publicly displaying, you know, thanks to the help of, of flight standards to to help us do this the appropriate way, um, the ability to, to look at both, you know, a certified TAF and then an automated um, TAF-like guidance to, to fill in the fill in blanks. Um, you know, and it's one of the reasons that I'm kind of excited about this low altitude weather, you know, three-tiered approach in, it, it opens the door for this, these other data sets that are out there, um, you know, satellite data, radar data, everything else that has definitely potential use, but doesn't have the same quality. So, you know, gives us some um, some ability to, to convey the difference between the two. Dave, All right, this uh, has been a great discussion. Uh, I need hey, to move on hey, to, the, to the next briefer. Hey, yeah. When you okay? No, okay. <laughs> that was Gordy. All right, so you know if you're familiar familiar with military operations, you know we've uh, we're talking drones uh, and unmanned flight in the civilian world and the commercial applications as an emerging business place. In the military, we've been flying drones for a long, long time. I remember being deployed to Bosnia. Uh, and uh, the first Predators flow ISR mission. So we have an expensive amount of experience with drones, what you can and can't do. And we've asked uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Williams uh, from the United States Air Force to give us uh, a quick DOD perspective. So uh, Andrew, are you online? Can you hear me? Go ahead. Okay, good. Hey, thanks. Um, First, I'd like to uh, extend some appreciation to the folks at the 25th Attack Squadron who helped me put this together. 
I reached out to them and asked them what kind of challenges they were seeing presently, and they, they helped me uh, with, with what you see on the slide here. And I, I'm having some network issues, so I apologize. Uh, I can't see the slide, so I'm just looking at uh, what I have from the past. So some of the challenges we have, and, and really it's, it's already been discussed in the last uh, 20 to 30 minutes here, so I'm almost kind of repeating some of the challenges that have been talked about. But um, a lot of data gaps that make what we're doing um, sort of uh, high risk in, in some regards. And this, you know, I know we're talking low level, but a lot of this can apply to the upper level as well from a UAS drone perspective. Um, so it's, it's validation of the, the weather models and how they're performing on that sort of, you know, synoptic scale we can do pretty good, but at the, the meso or micro level that these are operating at, it, uh, it becomes a challenge. Um, so the next challenge is the wind aloft forecast. There's not the precision. Um, and when we say aloft, you know, we could be talking, you know, sort of aloft at the surface or, or even higher up where these may be, um, you know, a few thousand feet up in the air. Uh, Andrew, did you get cut off? Okay, so let me fill in while he's coming back on the network. So what you uh, what you heard him talk is that wind aloft forecasts lack precision. Okay, so the bottom line is when you're flying in a military drone that's moving very, very slow and you enter into a headwind, uh, which is faster than what your airplane is moving, uh, you can go nowhere really fast and you run out of gas and your airplane crashes. Uh, been there, done that, have that T-shirt. So having accurate upper error data, wind forecasts in particular, and where the hazards are located is extremely important. Parse network of data. Now, here in the United States, uh, we've got limited amounts of data. I can tell you overseas in battle environments is even less. And and to add grief to that, uh, and uh, and again, this is a story from uh, the Serbia air war campaign. Uh, under realistic conditions, you're expecting for the observations to be honest. Uh, there are times when the bad guys will change your data and not report reality. And we had to use satellite data to really correct that. So getting Valid, correct information is extremely important for ceilings and visibility. Without that, uh, you really have a problem with drones. Convection is a big deal for uh, for drones. We got to have that uh, in particular for long forecasts as well. And this is another thing. I mean, when you're when you're talking a drone that's uh, flying five nautical miles uh, with a short battery duration, that's one thing. When you're flying a military drone that's got a loiter time of 28 hours, it's a whole different forecast challenge. Uh, you know, not only do you have to take off, fly through the weather to get the altitude, you have to be there for a very long time, which means a, a now cast isn't going to cut it. You're going to have to have to, a real forecast data pile so you can plan on where, how long can you loiter, where do you need to be, where are the targets. So having a much better confidence is important. And of course, yeah, I think I'm back. Yeah. Uh, okay, you're back. So I, I covered some stuff for you. I got down to convective weather products, but you can take it from there or cover anything you need to need. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Appreciate the uh, pickup there. So yeah, I, I don't know what was said, but um, you know, part of the issue is the that I, I talked about micro scale versus the, the larger scale. We can do good convective stuff at you know either a larger scale or the kind of the first few hours. But uh, as I heard you saying when I jumped on these, some of these missions go out, um, you know, more than a day in, in length. And so getting that kind of convective modeling to the precision that we need to, to know what's going to happen, one, it's a really fine scale, and two, a little bit longer time than you currently have is, is an issue. Um, and then to the icing and turbulence pieces, you know, um, it, it's hard. We don't really have good modeling right now that's going to give us the precision we need on, on either icing or turbulence for that matter and you know it was mentioned the cold soak effect basically um there's nothing that really resolves other than just knowing it's something that's going to happen probably is you know the, the a wing full of fuel is going to go up there and, and fly around for a little bit and, and come back down to the surface and can really get ice accretion much quicker on the wings from the, the fuel being in the wings and, and being cooled off from being up in those upper levels so that's just another another challenge that we deal with and there's nothing that really can tell us right now with a good 
confidence level when that's going to happen and, and to what degree. Um, so I think uh, that kind of covers some of the, the challenges that we see and that have been a challenge for a long time. We've seen some slight improvements, but um, a lot of these are going to require, you know, more computing power, more technology to, to get us down to those levels. And, and if that's, you know, some of that could be resolved by bringing on different tiers of sensors, as was mentioned, um, and being able to network those together and then know what confidence level we should have in those. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it back and see what questions there are. Okay, so that was a great coverage. Uh, and let me add one thing on, uh, and this is the reason I'm wanting to bring the military piece out. Uh, to me, uh, there are lessons learned here that we need to look at. Uh, there's no purpose in reinventing the wheel or or really making the same mistakes that we did in the Air Force. Uh, one of the things when drones first appeared in the Air Force is uh, let's throw manpower at the problem set. And we did that and it worked very effectively by having dedicated forecasters work with individual air crews that were flying uh, uh, these UAVs in different parts of the world. That works pretty good when there's a small number of them. But as you increase the number uh, throwing manpower at the problem is not an option, and certainly on the commercial side, that's definitely not an option. That's why we need to find alter alternative ways of doing business. So I'd like to know, is there any questions that you all like to ask uh, uh, of Lieutenant Colonel Williams? Boy, dead silence in the room. Anybody online? Okay, so Dave, anybody asking questions? Negative. Negative. Uh, nobody uh, in the nobody chat. In the chat. Okay, then uh, anybody from the panel that would like to add? Wow. So, uh, so Don, I have a question. Yeah. Okay. So, the Air Force has been operating drones at all different levels uh, all over the world for a long time. What have you learned about low level weather or weather and drone operations that civilian operations could glean from? Yeah, I I don't know that I have a good answer to that. I think part of what we learned is, you know, there was an assumption that because these things were autonomous that they were, um, well, I don't want to call it a broad assumption, but, but some people thought, you know, hey, they're, you know, they can kind of go do their own thing and be fine, but really they are so much more weather sensitive. So as the technology that brought these on uh, and allowed them to fly either line of sight or beyond line of sight was continuing to improve, the the risk that they took on, even though there wasn't a, a human in there, so it kind of decreased the risk, but the, the risk of weather impact continued to go up. Um, you know, I, I think some of us lovingly referred to them as paper mache toys. So um, you know, it was hard to get them to do a whole lot unless the weather was perfect and that we knew it was going to be perfect. So um, I, I'm not really giving you a good answer, but the, just learning that we needed a lot better information. As Mr. Shuffler alluded to, you know, we can't continue to increase manpower to throw at the problem. Um, and even the manpower, you know, does a good job but it at some point loses out. I, I think part of what I'll also add on to that is um, – Sometimes someone manpower the problem gives you a lot of good opinions, but that can also be um, a limiting factor when you have a, a, a lot of different organizations and entities trying to weigh in on what they think is going to happen, all, of course, with their own forecast and probably different opinion. And trying to sync that up and get it on the same page and deciding who has the weather call um, is something that we've, I, I think, gotten better at. I don't know that we're perfect on over. Go ahead. Yeah, th uh, thank you. Danny Sims, FAA. And um, the, the mention there of, of throwing the manpower at it and, and how that worked until you get too many operations and for not enough people. And also, I think in the previous um, uh, slides, there, there was talk about automation versus the human oversight. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm just thinking about that. And the amount of data that we're talking about and on the scales we're talking about, the data is huge. Very, very fine resolution, both in space and in temporal and in time, uh, because weather changes on very fine scales. You know, you talked about an increase of five, five knots in winds. 
uh, how that could make all the difference in the world. So to me, it's sounding like that's a nice thought to keep the human in the loop, but it simply isn't feasible. So it really, I mean, in, in my mind, and I'm certainly not right, but uh, necessarily, but uh, it sounds like we have to look to automation. So what are what are the challenges with that and how can we improve? Maybe not. Maybe it's not even a question of improving, but it's taking the automation. And just as we talked about with observations, qualifying it as to how good it is, qualifying the automation to know how good it is and then using that information. So I just I just wanted to get some thoughts on that because I just don't see the human being able to contribute, to be honest with you. Okay, so, so let me, uh, let me, so, uh, take, yeah. let me well, take that one well. here first. <laughs> so you, you've you okay. reached into okay. the crux of the debate in the weather business. What is the value added of the human being in the future? Uh, and certainly, I, I'd be inclined to say that, you know, by using AI ML techniques, for example, uh, doing pattern recognition and automation is going to help a lot. One of the things that we uh, we pushed, and I'm sure Don will be able to address that too, is when we first started doing this kind of stuff in Air Mobility Command with a focus on aviation, we looked at each mission set. And in those cases where it was clear that the mission wasn't going to go or it was going to go, you let the automation fully handle that. And the human being only engaged in those areas where it was skosh in the middle. Uh, and that was an approach that we used because you're exactly right. There is too much data out there to simply go it alone. That's why we use the term uh, overwatch because I don't think the human being is going to be able to do the same analysis we did 40 years ago. So you're going to have to have a combination of machine, AI, uh, and then the human being on top of that to really make the final decision. Uh, panel, I knew there were some people wanting to talk. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, Rob, you nailed it. I mean, I, I want to be careful about, I don't disagree that a human cannot be involved in managing data and flow of information and changing forecasts on the fly digitally that there's no doubt in my mind that's crazy uh it you know it's kind of reminds me of the i love lucy when they were trying to work on the chocolate factory and they kept coming faster and faster and they you know this is this is crazy thinking that we could do that but we got to use the human smartly and that means we have to change the way we think about how we use the human right and the human adds a lot of value today trust me in the go no go decision realm it doesn't mean they're looking at every product there's just techniques that they use to know when something's not working right and they get with the end user and they help them make a better decision to fill the gaps so i don't want to I, I think we got to be careful about saying there's no role for a human because when people hear that especially bean counters they love it they love it oh yeah no human yeah well that's not really what we mean we mean that we mean that there's still going to be a role for a human it's just going to be a different role in the future. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, and I would just add one, add one piece. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Just, just a quick add on to that from, from the, the military perspective is we've got to, you know, not only is the data, you know, okay or really great, but we have to look at the information warfare piece of that too. And, you know, can we trust it? You know, and what do you have overseas? whether we can trust it or not, it's going to be much more sparse and well-developed than what we'll have over here. So that's just another consideration that we have that, that a lot of folks in the FAA and the commercial side don't experience. Thanks. All right, great. Ralph, uh, before you go, there's somebody, uh, Eldridge Frazier from the FAA has their hand up uh, online. Okay, Eldridge, please more? go ahead. Yes, uh, I'd kind of like to pile on with Danny on the issue of automation and the human over the loop type capability. Uh, and I might have a misunderstanding, but it seems like that there are going to be multiple, multiple areas that that's going to have to be monitored as indicated by Bill uh, for an area. So I'm thinking that you're going to be in areas that's similar to what a cell phone tower is today, where you're in these little micro regions gathering information, and you would only want the data in that micro cell 
to go into your data for evaluation, whether you have a human over the loop or not. Is shouldn't that be the or is that the consideration? Well, I mean, you can certainly go down that approach, but it's very dependent upon the mission that you're you're working. So if you're if you're flying in a small drone that only has a five or six nautical mile range, that may be appropriate. But if you're flying in the drone that can you know fly from one end of the United States to the other, it's a different ball game. Anybody else online? Good. Okay, great. And now we're going to migrate uh, to the panel up here. Marilyn, over to you. Thanks, Ralph. Um, it's really good to see everyone in person. It's been a long time, many, many years. It's also really good to see lots of my former colleagues. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. And for those of you on the phone, I wish you were here as well. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about low altitude weather and AAM, advanced air mobility, EV tolls, electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, or C toll, V toll, um, lots of acronyms. But I think we all have an idea that the concept is these new aircraft that are not the small drones that in the FAA fall under Part 107. These are aircraft that initially um, will be primarily flown by a single pilot. Some will be autonomous immediately. But what are the problems here? Well, a lot of the problems are the same problems we've been talking about for the last several hours. There are gaps in the weather capabilities for these low level operations. When I talk about low level, uh, possibly below 5,000 feet, sometimes below 3,000, sometimes even below 1,000 feet. So um, who's going to be the provider of the weather service? Uh, wherever they are. Some are going to be urban, some are rural, some are within inner city only. Uh, where are we getting the weather services? And um, how are these aircraft going to be equipped? All these aircraft are going to be certificated. Not all the drones are certificated, but these are going through certification and they will have some sort of a certification. So that will they fly uh, VFR? IFR, are they icing capable? We don't know. So again, now we're going to think in terms of a pilot on board initially. What about the pilot off board who's remotely operating it? What about the autonomous operation and in visual or beyond visual operations? How is this all going to be accomplished? And what are these tools that the pilots are going to have on board the aircraft or off board the aircraft? Um, are they the same tools that we're talking about in the three tiers, or are they different? Uh, is it a combination of what exists now and, and what will be in the future? Will there be sensors on these aircraft um, that will give the pilot or the operator the information that they need? Um, will government and industry collaborate? And that's always a good one, because we've leaned on the National Weather Service forever. but. That can't, the National Weather Service can't provide everything. So there's going to have to be some new means of weather uh, prediction capabilities. And what about the non-traditional data that we've talked about? Is that going to be enough, safe enough? Uh, my friend Gordy uses the silver standard. If it's not approved weather or certified weather, is it a silver standard that's acceptable? And um, could artificial intelligence and computational fluid dynamics, modeling, digital twins, can that help? Is that going to be taking the place of, of the weather models that we know now, the traditional, or is it a blend? Are they going to add to something or replace it? And what about what we have now? Road traffic cameras, they're at low levels. They enable um, folks to go out and ice and, and uh, take care of the icing situations on roads. They can look at the road in real time and know what the situation is and take care of it for traffic, for vehicles. But could that also be somehow used for the new vehicles that will be operating? And uh, what about vertiports? We've all heard the term. What, what exactly are vertiports? Well, they're probably some sort of a blend of uh, a heliport and, and some 
landing pad scenario with charging stations or refueling if it's fuel, some sort of services and maybe a lobby situation for passengers. So it's a kind of a, a terminal slash maintenance slash recharging area. And it could be on a, on a parking uh, facility, could be on top of a building. Uh, some of them are located off the side of a building, uh, which could be a little precarious. Um, and uh, are, are these new entrant vehicles, what are the capabilities? Right now, we don't even know what all the prototypes are going to look like. Next slide. Oh, I thought we were doing that. Okay, so I've asked a lot of questions. Um, here are some thoughts. I don't have answers, but I do have questions. And because I work in this realm um, every single day, I, I hardly get any sleep because I always come up with more ideas and, and some are pretty bizarre. But if you look at the 600 different designs of these new aircraft, they're all very bizarre as well. So. Uh, maybe we need smaller and shorter range radar installed on the rooftops wherever, or, or towers or wherever we are putting these landing zones, we could call it, the vertiports. Maybe they need to be in several places because the wind doesn't blow only from one direction. When you have buildings that are tall on one side, short on another, you have maybe a shoreline or you have heat rising from the roads. So. Um, the Massachusetts-based Center for Collaborative Adaptive Sensing of the Atmosphere has created a network for emergency weather warnings, and uh, they do a pretty good job, and I'm a little bit familiar. I live in Connecticut, so um, they're right up the road, so to speak. Um, the data is fed into the National Weather Service. It sends warnings to users. So maybe crowdsourcing, one form of crowdsourcing um, could be a means of alerting for dangerous weather or sending out weather warnings. Um, so crowdsourcing, again, using internet connected cameras and sensors. And we see this starting to happen quite a lot. Um, Gary's left, but Gary's a big proponent of that. I remember about three years ago when we were at NBAA and Gary mentioned, why not use crowdsourcing? And, and several people started to kind of giggle about it. And um, so we're not laughing now, that's for sure. Um, so we've talked about changing the emphasis and not certifying the weather instruments uh, and going to standards, performance-based standards. Well, regulators are going to performance-based standards in the way that they um, do certification of aircraft. We're thinking in terms of weather uh, performance-based standards in the way that we certify pilots, especially the pilots that are going to be needed for these aircraft, are they going to be commercial pilots in the traditional sense? Well, maybe in the beginning, but the ab initio pilot may be totally different. So now we need to think about how are we going to train them? What's, what are we going to train? I've always said, and I say it over and over again, as a pilot, I've been a career pilot for almost 50 years. And pilots, from the time they take the private pilot, written test all the way up to the ATP or the dispatcher, the most failed area is weather. You can still pass any written and fail every question on weather. Now, do you want to send your loved one up with that pilot who doesn't know? And what's the first thing we pilots do before we go to the airport, before we pre-flight, before we call the relatives and say, I'll be there tomorrow? We're going to check weather. It is the most important thing, and yet it is the most failed area. So we need to think about that. Um, what about micronets that are spread across cities that can um, give information to these pilots? And weather drones. You're looking at a picture of a Mediomatic Meta drone. Uh, this is a company that puts sensors on their drones that measures everything. Um, there's also a NASA-sponsored project, the um, Weather Intelligent Navigation Data and Models for Aviation Planning, WINMAP, um, studying AAM aircraft and how to improve weather observations and forecasting by carrying weather sensors. So I would suggest that 
that is certainly one way to capture weather, put the sensor on the drone that you're flying, whether you're onboard it or you're offboard it. Um, modeling and simulation, we hear this a lot. Um, the algorithms, computational fluid dynamics, predicting every few minutes at, at a small um, uh, resolution. And fast eddy. Uh, so um, at some point, I think uh, Matthias could talk about that. This is, I believe, NCAR and UCAR's project with fast eddy. So maybe you'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and that is going to be key for these urban environments, putting vertiports on buildings. Next slide. Um, a few more ideas of what's happening around um, the low level weather. Um, expanding the weather cam uh, program, which is going on now in Alaska. And that may or may not be possible. It's very expensive. These weather cams are terrific, but uh, they cost $150,000 each. So it may not be possible to put them everywhere. Um, are there independent providers? We've talked about that. Uh, maybe Bill is going to set up a whole network of home weather stations, and uh, it'll be his retirement project. <laughs> not that I know that he's retiring. I'm not putting any ideas into anyone's head. Um, <laughs> Um, but, but we could have these personal stations that are located where you're going to fly. Uh, as I mentioned before, why use uh, information from an airport that's 50 miles away or 20 miles away or 10 miles away? Why not have weather in your backyard if that's where you're flying? Um, so if the pizza delivery is coming from two miles away, you don't need weather that's in the next county. You need the weather that's where you are. Otherwise, the pizza is going to be really cold. Um, satellite links for uploading and downloading the weather. We do that. Um, CFD and Large Eddy, I mentioned that before. Uh, looking at that for vertiports, I know there are a lot of companies that are um, doing modeling of cities. I work for CAE, and we are doing that for many cities around the world. Uh, because we're getting into AAM operations quite uh, elaborately. Um, I'll talk about EREP in just a second. That is um, a term I invented, I think. Um, digital twin, integrating the data from various sources. Uh, maybe we can get a picture from all of these different sources. And lastly, but not least, uh, the regulators and the stakeholders working together uh, toward changing policy to allow weather forecasting and now casting uh, by service suppliers using something other than the National Weather Service. And obviously we're leading, we're leaning in that direction um, and the silver standard um, term borrowed from Gordy. And next slide. Oh, okay. So um, this was an idea I had, oh, several years ago. Um, EREP, uh, meaning EV toll reports, kind of a takeoff on PIREPS. Um, Frankie, my friend, loves PIREPS, and she's always helping me with PIREP initiatives. Uh, it's an inside joke. Um, Real-time boundary layer weather, the EREP. So if you look at the short-term proof of concept, we have the, the wind sensor and the hardware and, and all of that. And it could be on the drone or it could be close by. And um, we're looking at, at that sensor software. And sensors now are, are very tiny. You could put sensors anywhere. And they're relatively inexpensive. And if we think in terms that they don't have to be FAA approved, then they could be cost effective. Uh, but we already know if you need a light bulb, it costs a few dollars at the grocery store, but a few hundred dollars to have it FAA approved. So um, maybe maybe we have different standards that still work. Um, and if you look to the right, we have maybe the drone that is operated by the human on the ground. We have information that is going sensor to drone, drone to sensor, drone to human, drone to ground and drone to drone, all these various concepts that could be 
the EREP or UREP, if it's a UAS report, sort of the idea of PIREPs. And then I'm going to ask um, my friend Ethan, who's sitting in the back, because I stole this from the flight profiler that Purdue has been working on. This is his idea at the bottom. So I would like to thank him for putting a lot of these ideas into my head and ask him if he wouldn't please just explain that bottom row. Do you have a mic back there, Ethan? So um, we agree with everything and are a huge supporter of everything that's going on here. And our niche is just accurate graphical representation of weather, which is the graphics that aren't coming out great um, along the bottom there. But it's to take these concepts that Ralph and Marilyn and, and everybody on the team here is talking about and make it easy for the non-meteorologist, the UAV pilot, the AM operator, the GA uh, uh, pilot to see what's going on in three dimensions. So it's not the greatest uh, um, visuals up there, but I think that is a tool that Marilyn and the team here is using to uh, achieve the goals of what the uh, whole organization and team are talking about. Thanks, Ethan. And um, they started out by using Flight Profiler for the GA pilot for low level interpretation of weather to determine where is the VFR weather, where are the clouds, where will I encounter clouds and how will I route myself so that I can still accomplish the flight but stay away from entry into IFR or clouds. So I thought in terms, wow, that's great. That could be used for the drones. It could be used now for the advanced air mobility, so multi-purpose, and um, there's a lot of research going on. So, and that is it for me. Okay, any questions from uh, the crowd? Bill. Marilyn, I am not planning on retiring. Not yet, I'm not being put out to pasture yet, but I do have a weather cam on my weather station at home. It was not $150,000. It was 59 bucks on Amazon, and it's ultra high definition, and it's live and time lapse. So when they come to deliver my pizza, they can look at my webcam, see what the weather's like in the field behind me, and land their drone. <laughs> Solve that problem. Any other questions? <laughs> Since it has uh, come up a couple of times, I have a question regarding the use of the term crowdsourcing. I've heard it in the context of like participating in a study where I was looking at weather camera information and verifying, technically verifying what the information was saying. I'm sorry, Gary, but that was a terrible study. I hated it, every second of it. But um, that that was one version of the crowdsourcing and then we also i also heard it multiple times in the sense of doing things like what bill has in his home network or his home station and i feel like there are two very different uses of the term crowdsourcing and maybe we either have to identify it separately or maybe define what crowdsourcing really is because it's getting a little bit muddy with that and one seems to be very useful and the other one not so much Maybe we just call it info sharing across multiple sources. Well, you know, you bring up a very important point, and uh, we probably do need to distinguish that. If you look at some of the efforts that are being done by industry, in particular the IT giants, crowdsourcing uh, is collecting data from various tools that weren't really designed to provide that data to start with. Uh, you know, for example, uh, there's an effort out there to collect all kinds of information from uh, cell phones. Uh, there's another effort where you can collect weather information from cars. These are all, uh, you know, they were not built to collect weather information. They just happened to get it. Whereas in Bill's case, that is a specific weather sensor, which isn't part of the NAS and not certified. So if you come back to our tiering concept again, you know, tier one data is AWOS and AWOS capabilities. Tier two would be things like uh, Bill has, and tier three falls in the remote sensing, crowdsourcing, and so forth. 
into into a third bucket then you have the sensors or the equipment that was designed to collect data weather data you have technology that it's been used to collect weather data but it was not designed to collect it weather data and then we have the third which is people verifying or adding additional information to the data which seems to be they just don't seem to the, the first two seem to be along the same lines and the same usefulness but maybe not so much the third one well that, that's all part of the evaluation that we're going to have to do you know when we first started the concept of tiering we talked potentially four tiers, maybe five, and now we're down to three. So I think we're still hashing that out. I think the overall objective is to maximize the amount of data that we have available uh, to meet the aviator's needs. Jason, sorry, as a, a representative of a fairly large data aggregator, do you have any comments on this last conversation? Give the man a mic, please. Sorry to put you on the spot, but that's what happens when you come to a live meeting and I know who you are. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Jason. I'm with Google. And we have a lot of interest in aggregating weather data for this, you know, exact problem. And I think we view it as an engineering problem. Um, a lot of data. How do you aggregate it? We're in a shift from numerical weather processing to, you know, using machine learning and AI and the computational strain, I think, on hardware creates all the issue here. and. We obviously deal with a lot of data uh, that we collect in, in various ways on the consumer side. Um, that's not part of the organization I represent. But yeah, these are all very important questions and and ones that we take um, that that we're tackling. It was actually just your comment kind of sparked in me a memory I had of something that we're working internally on at Google, just about you know enhancing weather data and using AI to basically narrow the focus on the on the weather accuracy we're able to get from say a 10 kilometer you know radius down to five, et cetera. So. Yes, this is uh, we love taking an engineering approach to this to this question. Thanks for asking. So, so okay, Ralph, one more. Is, Ralph, I'm Ralph, sorry. I'm sorry. We had one question in the back of the room. My name is Everett Whitfield. I'm not the man in the room. However, I do have a question. So I hear a lot of talk about data. So my question is this. Is it truly a missing? Is it truly missing weather information? Or is it more so the understanding and application of the current forecast and observation to operate within the constraints or the opportunities that exist because of the weather? Well, <clears throat> that's a that's an excellent question, and uh, I'm sure the operators and the meteorologists may have uh, deviating opinions on that. I can tell you, as an operational meteorologist, if somebody wants to fly low level, uh, I need information the models and the tools I have aren't good enough to give them the information that they need. So from my perspective, it's about getting more data. And it's not just more data, it's data from the right place at the right time. Uh, you know, that's one of the big problems with crowdsourcing from my perspective. You may get a million observations, but if they're all coming from an urban area or an urban environment, uh, that may help there, but it's not gonna help you where there is no data. And that's one of the big challenges in the, in the, in the weather business is, you know, there are places that are extremely data sparse and there's places that are overpopulated with data. Uh, and um, that hampers your ability to forecast for the mission. And frankly, it also degrades in the model because if you oversample in some parts and undersample in the other, the model output is negatively uh, impacted. All right, let me, uh, let me move on to now one of my favorite subjects. We have two and hands raised uh, there. Uh, two hands. Uh, that have been okay, there I get in. Let's go well, with the well, first it's, hand. It's your session, Ralph. You could no, tell no, Don. No, no, no. I can, no, I can no make this up. I, I want to have the opportunity for these people to talk. Okay, That's well, Andy McClure about. is first. He's calling all the way from Alaska. Okay. Go ahead, Andy. Go ahead. Yeah, good morning, everybody. <laughs> At least it is here. <laughs> um, anyway, I appreciate uh, Marilyn's observations. Uh, Good morning, Marilyn, and good morning, everybody else. But um, I've been talking a lot with uh, a friend of mine named Steve Dar, who has been working with uh, ADSB reporting uh, to the ground. He's making a lot of progress with it. I'm just wondering if that progress could be carried over into the EREP 
uh, realm. Uh, don't know how heavy the equipment is, but uh, I have heard a lot about ADSB being uh, possibly in the future required for certain types of uh, UAS systems. And uh, if ADSB is on board with sensors, then uh, possibly the PI reps could be coming from there, or the E reps, if you will. Um, another another couple things struck me uh, with the other comments that are coming on uh, just in the last few minutes. Uh, also, seems to me like with Bill and I know Matt has one. I have one. A backyard weather sensor. Uh, it would be probably useful to make a hybrid where the weather sensor owner could, when they feel like it, uh, enter comments. Like uh, back in the days when I was a, a flight service worker in, in a small station in Montana, and I was the weather observer when I was on, on shift. Uh, we didn't have an AWAS or an ASOS back in those days, but our observations and our remarks on the weather were frequently uh, extremely useful to pilots. I know this because they used to come on upstairs and tell me um, if there's a snow shower over one end of a runway, but not over the other end of the runway, they could uh, perhaps shoot a circling approach and make it in. So I think there's room in this whole discussion for uh, the human element to re-enter and uh, possibly be of some value. That's it. Great comments, fully concur. Uh, when I retire, I'll put out a weather observation. <laughs> Who is I, the second well, person? I online? could just answer Andy's one of Andy's questions. Hi, Andy. Good morning to you. Uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. As far as ADSB for the small UAS, because they are at such a low level, they're prohibited from having ADSB. It would be ground clutter, really, for um, controllers. I have been told, but. For the AAM aircraft, which could be integrated into the airspace uh, at the same level as helicopters and some other aircraft, yes, ADSB is going to be required. There you go. There you go. Now here's now here's the here's kicker. The kicker. Um, um, I was talking I was to talking Steve to Dar, Dar last Dar week, and he says uh, uh, he's afraid he's that afraid uh, his, project his project of getting, getting ADSB, ADSB pyreps down, down to the ground, the ground uh, may, uh, lose, may its lose its funding, funding soon. soon. So, so anybody who anybody thinks this is a great is idea a should be getting a hold of Steve Dar. I think you've just highlighted the need for an FPAW steering committee that can take these kinds of issues on. <laughs> there, there, was one there, there was another person that had a question. Yeah, but I don't know if you want to take it. It's Don. Ralph, oh. Ralph, Ralph I'm not going to give you a choice. You a choice. Um, <laughs> no, I think I think this conversation, I think just to clarify a couple of things, um, you know, we talked about crowdsourcing. We talked about data coming from weather instruments. We talked about data coming derived from instruments that provides weather information. We talked about people reporting weather data. I think the one thing we can't lose here, and I'll let Gordy and Kevin jump in here if I'm not right, is we're still going to have to have, even though we can use all these other different types of data sets, there's still going to have to be a chain of custody. There's still going to have to be some measure of security and reliability. There's going to have to be some quantification of the quality of that data, it's going to have to go through some kind of a, a process to be actually acceptable to be used. And when it comes to people and reporting data, they're going to have to be trained to do it properly. So we again, just trying to put, you know, me being the most usually aggressive person on these areas and going the furthest out, you got to, you know, re realize there has to be uh, some measure of control here. Otherwise, the FAA is not going to be comfortable with just doing that. And I think that doesn't have to be all government controlled either. I mean, what we're talking about is um, the way the UTM is being set up today, the Unmanned Aerial System Traffic Management Federated System. It's the same system we're looking at for the weather, SDSP, where um, you know folks will 
bring data in, but it's going to have to go through some kind of validation, calibration, checks and balances before it'll be accepted. So I just wanted to kind of end it with that, Ralph, just to make sure that, you know, we're not going off the deep end here. All right. Thank you very much, Don. And you mentioned the key word control. I'm now ready to take control of my meeting once again. And let's move on to uh, to the next briefer. And uh, I've got Claudia here and she's going to talk about helicopters. And let me tell you, uh, you know, I've I've. I'm not a pilot, but as a meteorologist, I've flown on many, many helicopters. And if there's a, an airplane out there that's really in low level weather, helicopters are at. So over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, so like Ralph said, I'm not a meteorologist. I'm a retired Coast Guard helicopter pilot. And tons of things have been going through my head listening to all these previous discussions. So I'm gonna kind of not really say what's on my slide, I think. Um, first of all, I spent, I started flying in the mid 80s and I, I think I can say I spent the bulk of my career without really having weather products. Uh, and as soon as I took off and left wherever I was uh, located, we just didn't have good weather uh, where we were going. And so you just had to rely on your, your eyeballs and your instincts and trying to get as much information as you could from outlying stations. Um, but I was also thinking back that every single one of my oh crap moments flying had to do with weather, whether it was normally fog and visibility, um, you know, a few icing and snow situations and then some turbulence. Uh, so those are all things that impact uh, helicopters and when I first, you know, got, I, I used to do weather, work weather with Matt for a while, and I recognized a lot of faces out there. Um, I kind of took a detour and went off and started doing UAS and UAM, and now they're kind of coming back together, and I'm, I'm really happy about that. It's, it's nice to be back in the weather uh, community. Uh, this is an area that definitely needs attention, and as a helicopter pilot, part of me was like, well, shit, didn't we matter, you know? <laughs> I mean, you know, we needed weather too. And we're not just drones flying around. Um, but on the other hand, I'm very glad that it's finally uh, getting the attention it needs. So that's one thing. Um, let's see, what else was I gonna say? Oh, I did wanna talk about uh, some of the weather products that are out there that are trying to get to this and have been trying to get to this. And number one would be the HEMS uh, tool from the Aviation Weather Center. That's uh, uh, was originally put out for uh, EMS helicopters who do have to go and land in all the, um, you know, offsite locations and they just didn't have good weather. And for my, Understanding of it, it, I know it's evolved a lot, um, but I think originally it took the, you can tell me if I'm wrong, okay, but I think it took the, the METAR information from different airports and kind of, you know, put those together and, and came up with a, a homogenized, okay, whatever. It, yeah, it's just kind we of interpolated, right? We scientifically extrapolated there the data go. to meet the mission need. <laughs> there we go, yeah. <laughs> And that was that was very, uh, you know, it has been very helpful. I think that's been an outstanding product. Um, I was going to ask if Brian uh, Pettigrew is on the phone. I know that the they've been working on that and they just came out with a beta of the beta test of the GFA uh, graphical forecast for aviation. Um, I don't know if anyone has gone to that site and seen it, but I, I clicked on it, you know, momentarily, and it looked like it was uh, going to be a really great product. So, yeah, Brian, is there anything that you want to just, are you there for one? I, I'm here I, I'm hiding here in, the in the silent corner. Okay. Is there anything you just want to tell us about it that you know, or, because I know you were involved with the HEMS product early on. I was involved early on. I'm going to defer uh, to some of our AWC partners that are also on the phone. Oh, we got a hand in the back. Jennifer Strews is on the Aviation Weather Center Warning Coordination Meteorologist. Oh, so great. happy to hear the good feedback on HEMS. Yes, yeah, so we just released beta.aviationweather.gov. 
So I encourage you all to go check it out, give us some feedback. Um, and the low level HEMS tool has been integrated into GFA now. So there's a toggle on it where you can go look at the low level information all in mm -hmm. one. So thank you for that feedback. Um, I don't know as far as specifics. I know it's gridded data. Um, so how does it, what is it, why, where does it get the information? Magic. Okay. No. <laughs> This is when I say that uh, I can definitely get you more of those details uh -huh. if, if you want one of my sure. cards afterwards and I can have some of our really smart people get you back with you on, on the details. I'm one of those one inch deep, mile wide people, so. Yeah, that's okay, I'm not a smart person either, so. But, it's, but it is a great plug for uh, beta, please go check it out. Yeah. Gordy. Okay. Um, I don't know what else to say about this one. Uh, I've heard talk about, to me, like uh, weather cameras. That would be my first choice because uh, every time that we would, like you see in the pictures here, this happens to just actually be out of my mom's window in Santa Barbara, but I was just sitting there and, you know, there's a nice little set of mountains there and you can see on the picture on the left, you know, there's just a real little bit of fog starting to come up over the mountain. And I think uh, most pilots fly out of a, a fixed base that they're used to and they, you get to know the weather there, right? And for some reason they always put airports like right by the ocean. I don't know why that is, but uh, and they always get foggy the first. And so you get to know your location and you know what conditions, you know the dew point spread exactly, and you know when it hits here that it's gonna be 10 more minutes before it hits here. And it's things like that I think that the human is always going to sort of be involved because they get to know those kind of things. Maybe AI can do it, I don't know, I guess. Right. <laughs> but but in the good old days, you know, you just get used to these things and it's that kind of input that you can't really quantify. That's not even going to be in a weather report that is going to tell you, you know, when you need to head back. And that's all I got. OK, so uh, let me add on one quick war story to uh, to the helicopter mission. Uh, you know, you've heard me talk about NATO a lot during my time in Europe. We took observations, METARs, and correlated them to terrain. Mm -hmm. And so when we used to fly the border, if an observation that was perhaps 10 miles over there, we could overlay it on the terrain to tell helicopter pilots you're going to be able to fly or not. So there's a lot of human techniques that you can use. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, it takes time and money to make that happen. But you know, when you're getting ready to deal with those bad guys across the other side of the border, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's the way you do business. So any questions for Claudia? Anything you want to know about helicopters, weather, anything on your mind? I I'd, just like to add, uh, I'd like to add just uh, not, a, not a war story, but uh, similar. I flew rotorcraft and fixed wing and did a lot of night cargo to build time. Flew cargo around in terrible airplanes. And I flew out of an airport next to a river, uh, which emptied into the ocean. and as you said, a lot of times when tower was closed and you didn't have weather, you knew in the spring and the fall just what time of day, what kind of conditions there would be fog and you'd need to go land at a different airport, wait for the sun to come up, burn the fog off and then go back home. So um, there is a, a place for the human element. Um, sometimes we don't need the pilots, but even if they're off board, they can be of use. Okay. Okay, go ahead, please. Oh. Brian, if somebody has got a question, please uh, let them add in. We have a hand up. A hand up. Okay, let's go for it. Uh, Adia, sir off. Go ahead. Hey, hi, thanks. Hi, thanks. Uh, Claudia, I have a Claudia, question. I guess. Uh, have there been any studies done on uh, quantifying the sensitivities of helicopters to winds? I guess basically things like 
how how high a wind can a helicopter sustain things like that yeah 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 you bet <laughs> Every airplane yeah, has got that. It's, it's been certified. Um, yeah, I mean, I will say that is one great thing about helicopters is you can just turn into the wind. Usually, you know, if you're coming into land, it doesn't really matter what direction the wind's coming from as long as you can turn into it. Okay. Any other questions still online, Brian? Anybody else out there? No, we, okay. had one, we had one one comment, one comment. Go ahead. about the common uh, the, uh, the combination of wrap and, and lamp and model, lamp data, model data, data is the source the on GFA. GFA. Ah. OK, great. All right, so now it's time for a. A break, you guys have a question. OK, go ahead. comment with mention of the weather cameras in Alaska, of course, and there are probably other people online that can give more details. Those are leaking out of the state of Alaska um, into what Colorado and Montana at the moment and well, Hawaii. So the FAA, as I understand it, and again, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, FAA is paying for the ones going in Hawaii. The rest of them in the CONUS, however, are non-owned cameras. So like the state of Colorado, et cetera would install, maintain them. The FAA would take them and use them or include them in their in their website. And mentioned at a recent meeting in Montana where they're enjoying those is during the fire season last year, the ASOS was or AWAS was giving solidly VFR conditions, but the weather camera was showing the wildfire smoke. It was definitely not VFR. So there's some more work I think that needs to be done in that area, which just gets back to this amalgamation of sensors. And a comment. Trying to see back. Go ahead. No. So I wanted to ask just real quickly about the sensors on helicopters, what those capabilities are and how widespread they are. I mean, there's a lot of talk about putting sensors on UASs. What have been the challenges from the helicopter community? And are there sensors there? And uh, I see the head shaking no. So what? what's the, ch why the, cha I mean, what? what's the big challenge to getting them? And if we can't get helicopters outfitted, what's the likelihood of getting UASs outfitted with sensors? But if I've got a sensor, it's not gonna tell me anything about where I'm going. And if I'm just a single, aircraft going somewhere maybe it'll help someone coming behind me but chances are there's not going to be that many people coming behind me because i'm just going to an accident scene or something well actually there is a sensor aboard helicopters a very accurate one you're looking oh. at it right there well <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah let's take a break everybody come back at the top of the hour please thank you Gentlemen, test one, two, test one, two. It is time to rock and roll. And if we don't get going really fast here, what's going to happen is that Gary Picodner's session is going to be canceled. So uh, we've 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 really got to get going here. <laughs> No, we're not going anywhere, but, you know, people do want to go home, I suppose, yeah. stuff like that. So, so Gary Picodner, I'm going to put you in charge of getting Ralph and his panel back on time, because any time that they use up uh, is going to come out of you, extra time is coming out of your budget. Hey, we're going to be on time. <laughs> we're always on time. Uh, well, Rhonda's the, the Rhonda's the... <laughs> all right here we go i'm on i'm live all right so we talked about helicopters let's just briefly talk about fixed wing uh you know fixed wing aircraft tend to move faster than helicopters 
which means they encounter the weather quicker. Uh, and so, you know, when you're flying along at a relatively quick speed, the issues of visibility changing, running into turbulence, uh, lower ceilings approaching all are, are a much bigger challenge. And of course, they have the same issue. You have the weather at, at, uh, at takeoff and landing, but there's very little information in route. So it comes down to reliance on the pilot. The other thing is on the pictures here, you see relatively small aircraft. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the Air Force and we actually flew C-5s right over the top of uh, the ground. Uh, there was a couple of times where I thought I could reach out and touch the top of the trees. It was actually pretty, uh, pretty scary. Uh, uh, but the bottom line is the size of the aircraft also makes a big difference. You know, if you're flying in a small airplane, you're going to deal with turbulence considerably different than when you're flying in a, in a C-17 or a C-5. So it, knowing those things are very important. We need, to, we need to have tailored weather information based upon the aircraft type that's out there. You just can't come up with one set. Uh, I, can, I can remember we used to get PIREPs, uh, from Piper Cubs over the Sierra Nevadas, the National Weather Service would issue a, a SIGMET that would cancel all flying, and my C-5s were sitting on the ground. So we'd have to go through the process of overriding that and, and so forth. So really tailoring weather information to the type of mission, uh, in particular in the low levels, is very important because different airplanes are going to have different requirements. You know, speed, size makes a very big difference. Uh, and, and now to... Uh, Try to get us back on schedule. Uh, Don Birchoff, you're up to talk about transiting aircraft through low altitude weather. No. Okay, Ralph. Uh, thanks. Basically, you hit on it, Ralph. You know, the challenge we have is is that the aircraft that we're dealing with here in the drone air taxi industry are lighter. Uh, they they are more weather sensitive. Uh, they fly ubiquitously. Um, there's no guarantee that there's going to be set routes for small aircraft or small UAS flying below 400 feet. Um, there'll also be other um, types of aircraft that might fly higher than that. We're going to talk about more advanced air mobility aircraft that are going to be flying probably in the 1500 to 5000 foot AGL moving from regional airport to regional airport, carrying cargo, uh, you know, from regional airport to regional airport, carrying people on electric uh, air taxis in, in urban areas. Um, you know, we're talking about a totally different animal because these aircraft have to remain light in order for them to be electrified. So weight is, is the guiding principle behind everything when you're flying battery powered electric aircraft. And that means that the engineering that goes into these is limited by the weight of the aircraft. So, so they're gonna be more weather sensitive. You also wanna think about flying people and air taxis. Um, you know, your aircraft might be able to handle, uh, you know, moderate to severe turbulence, but the question is, will the people in the air, airframe be able to handle it. And what happens when they get sick? Well, they want to re, you know, take that ride again. So we're not even talking about aircraft, uh, about operating on the limits of their op of their airworthiness. We're talking about the limits of the client that can operate in them. So you got to think about all this when you're trying to let, think of the uh, airspace of the future, where you have small drones flying around, uh, some of them are fixed wing. Some of them are, are, are rotary. Uh, rotary handles um, updrafts and downdrafts better. Fixed wings do not handle updrafts and downdrafts better uh, as well. Um, you've got a varying types of drones that have different weather sensitivities. Um, they're going to have the weather sensitivities we're talking about are going to be much smaller in scale than what we're used to dealing with manned aviation. And in some cases, there won't be pilots on the aircraft. So we've really got to get our head around when these aircraft are transiting, how are we going to give them the situational awareness that is going to be required to operate them safely at the airworthiness certification levels that they're allowed to operate on and to do it efficiently also? Because the other problem is these uh, types of aircraft are not going to have high margins like the bigger air airframes. Um, there's going to be very tight margins 
There's going to be high density operations. It's going to be about throughput, which means you're not going to have uh, you're going to be uh, some some of these uh, operations. They're looking at transiting 60 air taxis into a Verta port uh, an hour. Right. Um, they're talking about. Flying in, some of them talk about dropping people off underneath into a, underneath the ground. And then that airframe just taking off, the next one coming in behind it. So you've got to think about this whole concept operations as something that we've never seen before. And of course, weather is going to become more impactful because you have less slop and less room in the system to deal with it if you want to maintain those high density operations. Um, they're going to be flying ubiquitously, as we talked about. There's not, they're not going to be near airports except for those that use the airports for heavier lift cargo or um, air taxi operations from Verta ports, say down in Fort Lauderdale out to the airport. And the urban challenges for the Ventura winds and the heat island, this is something that you know helicopters have to deal with today. And you know, that's the reason why. There's such a high, you know, incident rate with helicopters flying in urban areas. If you talk to Rex Alexander, he'll tell you stories about having a lack of wind data and information in cities is a major challenge. And he's and that's when they're in the aircraft flying the aircraft. So these are things that we've got to think about with transiting aircraft in an environment with all these different types of airframes with different weather sensitivities, um, flying ubiquitously with no air, no person on board the airframe. And what losing the heuristics is really going to mean uh, to these air, airframes, because they want to, you know, to be effective, they're going to want to have as much automation and they're going to have less piloting in the in the in the cockpit or in the in the uh, operations center. Um, so I just wanted to try to paint a picture of, of what this future might look like and why what we have to do is so important and why our approach to doing it has to be different than what it's been in the past because it it won't scale. Thanks, Ralph. Okay, any questions for Don? Okay, any questions on the chat? All right, we're good. Well, thank you very much, Don. We've uh, we're really made up some time, which uh, will leave us a uh, good discussion at the end. There, there, there the was one chat side. question, Don. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, there sorry. was one. Okay, go ahead. Uh, it was from Matt Johnson. Is Metro Aviation considering to share this data? Metro Aviation. I'm sorry. I, I, I share what data? I, I just need a little more clarity on the question. Yeah, uh, Matt. Do you want to? Or Matt Johnson? Do you want to clarify that? Uh, I guess not. OK. I mean, I, if I could take a shot at what I think he's referring to, um, you know, if we're talking about data collection and, you know, one of the things that's very interesting is, is I've been working with different OEMs, um, you know, like a Joby's or, you know, I'm using them as an example. I'm not calling them out specifically, uh, you know, Archer and others. You know, some some folks are starting to think about how they're going to collect data from their platforms. And if they if they will do that, and how some of these Verta ports, whether they're going to be publicly owned or privately owned, and um, and data that's sensors that are placed at these locations, um, who's going to pay for them? Because um, it, it's it's well understood that the federal government's not going to pay for all the sensing that's going to be required to close these gaps. It's going to be a combination of um, state, local government, private sector that's going to wind up procuring the sensing capabilities that will fill these gaps. And there is a question about, you know, will all data be available to everybody if it's, especially if it's um, something where an OEM has proprietary information that they don't want to share for some reason. It's no different than say our wind farms today. You know, a lot of wind energy uh, producers don't share their data from their, their weather data from their turbines. Um, so it's it's a question. It's it's a good question. Uh, I think that the future is going to be a market driven one to some extent um, because of the fact that, you know, the infrastructure costs are going to, you know, add up. And if you want to get infrastructure deployed, it's going to have 
somebody's going to have to be incentivized to produce that, provide that infrastructure. I don't think it's going to be a freely uh, free data all system. Um, people may have to pay for some data uh, in this in the system in the future, and it may come out through different types of fees and things like that that uh, folks will pay to operate in that in that area. It's a good question. I don't know the answer, but you know I don't know if that helps at least. Um, put some, put the, put out some questions that are still out there about how this might evolve in the future, and I hope that helps answer that question a little bit, or at least get you thinking about it. Thanks, Ralph. Thanks, Ralph. All right, thanks, Don. All right, let's talk about vertiports, instrumentation of vertiports. This is a, another big debate. Uh, I've had the opportunity to review publications that are happening here in the United States, as well as publications that are happening in Europe, and uh, I, I see what I call the status quo happening. Uh, you know, there's on the one side of the push, we got this thing called AWOS, ASOS, let's install that. Or, you know, we don't do anything. Today, in a lot of, um, you know, airports, there's no instrumentation or just a windsock. Uh, and, and the issue comes down to the fact we put an AWOS in there because we want to have the ability to land IFR. If it's a VFR condition, well, you really don't need any weather sensors because you have this pilot person that's going to observe what the weather is. So from my perspective is, as we go down to the path of future with unmanned or uncrewed aircraft, uh, we need to have sensors out there that as a minimum measure cloud height, visibility, and winds. And frankly, as a weather guy, I'll say I'd really prefer to have a full METAR because that's going to enhance our, our weather network, improve our microscale modeling, and all those capabilities go with that. And the data... <clears throat> needs to be of a quality that's comparable to an AWOS, uh, and uh, it should be updated pretty routinely. I believe that uh, every two minutes is uh, is the way to go. And when we cite it, it ought to be cited in such a way where it's not just good uh, around the five feet, but rather for a, a much larger distance, preferably at least five uh, statute miles. And and I think the the big deal is we need to also hook it in with the cellular networks. I mean, you know, there's 5G being developed. We need the data back quickly. Uh, we need the data latency there. Uh, we can't come up with some sort of dial-up capability or, or relaying it via multiple systems. It needs to be available to everybody quick, fast, and efficient. Put it in some sort of cloud repository where it's, where it's available. And then finally, and this is my big push on this, we don't need to reinvent the wheel here. This technology already exists. It's cost effective out there. You know, let's make a decision. Let's buy this stuff and let's put it out there. Uh, you know, for us to come up with some program that designs some new smaller weather sensor and we take five or 10 years to build it is totally unnecessary. You can go off the shelf today and buy a weather sensor for a reasonably a priced amount today. So let's go and do this because I think that's the key and instrumenting vertiports and getting this uh, AAM and uh, UTM industry really going from a weather perspective. Any questions? Yes. Hey, Ralph. Um, if we do that, I agree with you, and there's obviously some opportunities to leverage technology and low-cost sensors already, but if we already start to, let's go do this and start instrumenting vertiports, are we getting out ahead of the performance-based standards and the three tiers and still working out that definition, or can we just start doing this? Well, I, I'm going to be very honest with you. I've looked a lot of these, um, these uh, cost-efficient sensors as part of the effort to develop performance standards. And they are very, very close to meeting AWOS and ASOS type capabilities. There's very little difference. So, you know, I think the sooner we go and do this, the better off it's going to be. And I can tell you that my company has already bought the first few. We want to test these things, how good they are, so we can actually demonstrate to the FAA and the regulators that by putting these sensors out there, we can safely provide an operating environment for the UAM industry from a weather perspective. And I think the more test places we do this, uh, the more comfortable the regulators will become that we can actually make this happen. Yeah, Ralph, let me uh, comment on this. Also, I've been working closely with uh, some vertiport designers and folks like that. 
And, you know, I think that the fact that the FAA, I mean, you got to understand, we can't wait. You know, we're, what we're trying to do here is build an airplane and fly at the same time here as we move into this new data performance standard realm. Um, the OEMs I've talked to said there's no way they're going to put ASOSs and afford to put ASOSs at a Vertiport. Um, you know, they're afraid to go out and buy equipment today because they don't know if it's going to be approved or not later. Um, what we're trying to do is, and you know, what, what I've been working with uh, the standards group is to try to show a path where the FAA is very favorable now to data performance standards, which they have come on board and said, which has been very helpful, right? So now we can go back to the OEMs and say, look, um, you know, you can apply for, you know, let the FAA know what you want to do. I mean, it's a pretty simple argument, you know, WinSOC or ASOS. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous when you really think about it. There's nothing in between. So, you know, you, you're going to let us put a, a WinSOC in, but you're not going to let us put a $40,000 piece of equipment that's almost as good as an ASOS, right? I mean, it's almost kind of ridiculous, right? So what we want to do is work with the FAA to get some of these use cases done, like Ralph's saying, and then bring that data back. And then meanwhile, give the operators some sense of, of uh, comfort that that sensor will more than likely be uh, approved because it's going to meet a data standard, performance data standard that's going to be uh, accurate enough for the operations that will be taking place at that location. So I think it's going to be, uh, uh, it has to go in concert. The other thing I want to mention is that, you know, Vertiport, depending on where it is, if it's in the middle of, you know, Manhattan, uh, a surface observation is not going to be good enough. Um, we're going to need to have three dimensional winds. Uh, looking around that area when you have um, airframes coming in from, say, LaGuardia, and you're going to be, you know, taking these light aircraft into areas where there's Ventura wind effects, you know, the winds, you know, just because the winds at Newark are blowing at 270 at 15, uh, 10 knots doesn't mean they're going to be blowing 270 at 10 knots at the Vertiport. They could be blowing 180 at 25 knots because it all depends on the Ventura winds and the direction of the winds in the canyons. And so the bottom line is, is we're going to need better uh, measurements around these vertiports uh, because of the fact that if you want to fly high density operations and you want to have predictability and reliability in when you are promising people they're going to get from the vertiport to the airport on time so they don't have to drive, you better have, you know, much better characterization of the environment. And the good news is NASA is funding some projects now. There's going to be an urban weather sensing test bed at Hampton, Virginia. Uh, it's going to have two rotating scanning wind lidars up to 2,000, uh, 6,000 feet, 10 meter resolution, 20 kilometer area. There's going to be in situ sensors around a vertiport location that are going to be tested, and we're going to be looking at you know an MRI of that area and atmosphere to see you know what we learn about how these winds really behave and what's what's the requirement going to be for for weather data and information. So I just wanted to also you know provide that as some input, Ralph. Well. Okay, thanks, Don. Thanks. Any any uh, last question on that, Randy? And Don hit on an important point. Important point that I was going to bring up. Um, I, I agree with everything you say up here about your instrumentation for the vertiports, but for new vertiports, that doesn't necessarily apply. And we just saw that with the, uh, the study that MITRE just did for us on uh, using uh, basically a six meter resolution uh, model. 30 feet makes a difference in some cases. Um, so not only for your, you know, trying to put in a vertiport, but your sensors for that vertiport. And, you know, we think about, uh, you know, if it's behind a building, well, that building may create a, a kind of a dead zone, but if the wind's coming from another direction, now it's, you know, you've got lift, you've got um, uh, uh, downslope winds, you got all kinds of things you got to worry about. Um, so yeah, putting a putting a sensor up there is great, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, you know the, the end all for everything because there are you know those those true micro scale issues that you have to deal with for uh, uh, even citing these things. Fully agree, and and keep in mind this is the beginning from my perspective. You know the challenge we have today. You know if you don't know what VFR conditions are. You got to have an exception to policy from the FAA to fly, even if the weather is absolutely perfect. So if we can lick that, then we're we're on the right path, and then add on additional sensors. All right, let me move on to uh, to the next subject, and you know, 
one of the things that we always forget about is training. Training is very, very important. Uh, and it's not just training for the meteorologist, but also training for the operators. So they understand how to use our information where it applies. So Marilyn, over to you. Thanks, Ralph. Um, so it's great to have weather. Um, and it's great to know what it's doing, where it is, and so on. But if that information doesn't get to the individual who's actually operating the vehicle, whether it's someone off board or on board, it does no good. And if that person doesn't understand all those fancy terms you use in meteorology or how you come up with all of the uh, numbers, then that person isn't really interested because they just want to know, can I go from A to B? So what is it that pilots need? And um, I've had extensive experience flying all kinds of aircraft. I started in gliders and finished my career um, before I joined the FAA in commercial jets. And then the FAA was kind enough to get me a gyroplane rating. So I've had a little of everything. Um, and regulatory-wise, the pilots are required to be knowledgeable in sources of weather information and effects of weather on performance. So what does that mean? What, what, how does the pilot know where to go to get the weather information? And once they have all that wonderful information, they've looked at every chart and they've seen all the squiggly lines, how do they take that chart and make it work for them in performance when they actually get in the airplane and try to go from A to B. Um, as I said previously, for those who were here a little earlier, uh, testing. All pilots have to be tested, even remote pilots, so they take a, a written test. And weather is the most failed area. Wouldn't it be nice if each area on a written test was graded separately from one another and you needed a 70% on all of the areas, not just the whole? Just a thought. Um, that would ensure that pilots would have to be knowledgeable a little bit in weather. Um, and, and do we train weather correctly for these pilots? Why is it so failed? Um, the NTSB says the largest percent of fatal accidents have weather implications. We can think back to recent accidents. We can think to Kobe Bryant that was flashed all over the papers for quite a long time, and weather certainly played a part. Did the pilot pass the check ride? Did the pilot pass the written? Did the pilot pass the check ride to work for that company? Probably yes for every question, but obviously something went wrong. Um, it, it, it was a training issue that the pilot had of, rec of not just training to be able to do the flight, but to recognize challenges and changes maybe that were occurring. Maybe it was something that wasn't predicted, or maybe the pilot didn't look at the most accurate weather depiction for the flight that that individual was doing. Or it was that get homeitis or get thereitis. I think I can do it. You know, I've, I've gone that route before. So I could probably, you know, I can see the highway, could probably fly following a road. Um, IFR is not I follow roads, but some people think it is. So um, understanding your resources. Pilots are overwhelmed. You've got the National Weather Service that has a million kinds of charts. They all tell you something, but do they tell you what you need for today's flight? And do you need all of those charts? And how do you interpolate? How do you, how do you pick the one that's most important for you, not for the airline pilot at 30,000 feet if you're flying a 172? So pilots need to understand how to make decisions about collecting weather information. Um, I'm gonna suggest that you take a look at one of those little pictures over there that says advisory circular. It's AC, um, 91-92, and I'm going to take credit because I'm very proud that was the last thing 
I did before I retired from the FAA. It was published after I retired. It was my last project. And Janet, thank you. Janet and her team and Frankie. There were so many people that got on board this project to try to develop a document that told pilots, primarily GA pilots, CFIs, how do you gather information? How do you do a self-briefing? We know that flight service stations, you can't go and walk in them the way I used to. We used to do a cross-country flight as a duel with my instructor when I was training. We went to the flight service station. We walked in, the briefer told me all about charts, gave me charts to take home. They were really cool. But you could go in and a briefer would actually talk to you. And there was always that 1-800 weather brief phone number and you could call and talk to someone. Well, we don't do that so much anymore because there are so many tools on the internet. So now we have um, challenges to gather the appropriate information. Who's training the pilot? Does the CFI know enough to teach another pilot what's important. Have we trained our CFIs properly? They may not. You know, sometimes the CFI looks at, at having that certificate as the stepping stone to something else, and they're gonna be there only as long as it takes to get to something else. I still teach almost 50 years later. I love teaching, but I'm not the majority. Most people want to get a CFI so they can collect hours and go somewhere and do something. Do they do the right thing by their students? Maybe, but maybe not. Um, when I was in a FISDO at the FAA and I was responsible for doing CFI check rides, I would ask a lot of weather questions. And if someone couldn't tell me the answer, they never really got out of the oral and went and flew. And so I had over a 90% failure rate and people didn't want to get scheduled with me because I failed them. Except that I took exactly what was out of the APTS or ACS. I wasn't asking questions that they weren't required to know the answers to. So I would suggest that we should think about doing a better job training pilots, not just giving them more weather information, but tell them how to use it and which information is critical. You can give them all sorts of fancy information that comes from all different uh, tools and devices, but if they don't know how to put it together, to use it for the flight that they're making, it isn't any good. And now let's think in terms of these non-aviators flying drones and now potentially flying the eVTOL aircraft. Now we have pilots who don't come from that progression of student pilot, private pilot, commercial pilot, ATP, so on and so on. We may have an ab initio that starts in an EV toll and does not have the background or the experience in the environment, and now they're flying in an environment that's challenging. You could put sensors on the vertiport, but when you have buildings tall on one side, short on another, rising air, heat, ocean uh, breeze, that pilot could start an approach with wind predicted from one direction or measured from one direction and all the way down that approach have the wind change and and have that pilot be completely befuddled and perhaps they don't have battery life to do a go around because these aircraft have very short battery lifespans um so um another another uh, problem, applications that pilots use. They don't always go to the National Weather Service. Sometimes they use these third-party applications. And sometimes the third-party applications are not standardized. Colors are different. So if you're used to red meaning something and now you use a different application and it means something else but you haven't really paid attention, are you getting the right information? Are you using the application that's best for you? And, and we don't control that. Third parties um do whatever depiction they feel like they want to do they they all take weather from the national weather service and then reproduce it um we know that pilots aren't meteorologists so how do we teach them to prioritize the weather you know we've all talked about weather and and you all know what you're all talking about and and i do now but i didn't start out understanding all of this language. 
H triple R had no meaning to me going from A to B. It had no relevance. So why would a pilot care about it? Let's think about what we need them to know. So I've already mentioned that CFIs, um, some CFIs are great. Some CFIs are caring, they're professional, they're knowledgeable, and others, they're getting from CFI to airline as fast as they can. And what their students learn may or may, may not be important. Now remember, most students who become private pilots, that may or may not be the only certificate they get. Maybe they just want to be a private pilot and go fly around and get the $100 hamburger or whatever. And so if they're not trained properly, they're not going out after that to get additional training. So um, private pilots may have a lack, a, a gap in what they've been taught. And we go into the commercial operations, and most of these operations, whether it be drones, Google, their wing operation, um, or the EV tolls, which will be operating commercially under part 135 for the most part, there are requirements. They have to meet certain weather requirements. The aircraft, the pilot, the, the company providing information. So that is a higher level of requirement because now you're carrying passengers for hire. We're obligated to keep these people safe. There's more risk. Um, next slide. So um, if we look at, at now some of the challenges here when we're training these low-level operations in new environments, we have off-board pilots to think about, uh, flying drones. The picture on the right, um, I believe, is Kitty Hawk. Um, they've been operating in Africa for years. Um, different environment, different airspace system, different requirements. Here in the US, um, maybe they can't do exactly what they did there. Uh, night operations beyond visual line of sight over populated and unpopulated areas. So now, um, these environmental concerns beyond understanding weather itself, but how does the environment and the low level operation impact wind? Okay, now I just got my weather forecast and they told me about wind at 3,000 feet in the area I'm going to fly, but I'm flying at 400 feet. So how do I interpolate? Is there a means to interpolate? How, how do I know what to do with what's available? Can I make it appropriate for me? And I would say the answer right now, right now, is maybe not. Uh, maybe the Bauman backyard weather camera slash station is the answer. I put one up wherever I'm going flying and it gives me a picture and it gives me some low wind. Um, so um, these pilots aren't flying off airports most of the time. We don't have weather everywhere. We already know 97% of the CONUS is absent weather. Um, so uh, pilots are not really good at interpreting computer generated data so that they can identify hazards. How can we better train them to learn how to do that? Instead of just giving them data, how do you interpret the data? Do we have a, a training tool for that? Um, I don't know the answer, but I know that for the most part, pilots are very confused by weather. I teach part 107, um, and I teach it primarily to police departments in Connecticut where I live. And I will tell you, I get that blank stare when I start teaching weather. And it, it's so difficult to try to teach weather to someone who doesn't understand aviation, who's not going to ever be inside an airplane or a helicopter, and try to, to pick something on a one-dimensional piece of paper and make it realistic. So I think we ought to be considering how to train weather more than let's develop more weather to throw at people. How do we have them understand what we've given them and what we're offering them? Um, uh, the picture on the bottom right 
is what you probably see in the newer EV toll type aircraft, the AAM. That's it. <laughs> that may be the entirety of the controls. Maybe no pedals, no stick, no throttle, a couple of screens. Now what are we training? Any thoughts or questions or comments? I've actually got one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Since I'm right here. Okay. What is your thought on, I mean, that is a question. How much, how much does a 107 pilot need to know about weather? What, can't we get smart people to translate that weather for them and say it's either yes, you fly or no, you don't fly? Okay, so what do we require? They're not required to have the same um, regulatory compliance as the Part 91 pilot or the 135, but they have to be knowledgeable. They have to do pre-flight. Uh, but what does that mean? You know, if a Part 107 pilot says, well, I'm just going to fly within my little neighborhood and I can always see the aircraft, and I looked at the weather this morning, my favorite meteorologist on TV said, it's going to be a nice day. All right, maybe that's good enough. But if you're delivering packages, you're going beyond line of sight, um, or you're even doing kind of a daisy chaining of, of visual observers, you really need more. And I find from having been within the FAA and speaking to the applicants, they don't really want to be burdened with more than the minimum that's necessary. What do I need to accomplish the mission? I don't want to pay for more than what I need. I don't want to have to learn more than what's required. So I don't know how you make them want to know more about weather. Hi, Frankie. Well, you know, Marilyn, this is Don. Wait a minute, Don. Don, Don, Don hang Don, on. No, Frankie no. has a question. No. Oh, Frankie. Go ahead, Frankie. No. Um, to, to piggyback on a couple of things here, in, in the what you were just talking about, about the information, the Part 107, today a student pilot, for example, that doesn't know how to interpret the weather, they call flight service and they have someone that can do the interpretation for them. The problem we're encountering is that in a flight service station, you still don't have the information that you need. The closest thing I can tell you, well, you're about 50 miles from the airport and this is what's happening at the airport. I don't know what's happening in your backyard. I can't see Bill's camera from my backyard, right? So we also don't have, the people that can do the interpretation don't have the tools that they need. Um, as far as going a little bit back on the training, Marilyn, uh, I think you are aware, but after the AC, we also develop a VFR training for pilots with the FAST uh, team. So the FAA has one more tool for general aviation pilots that are learning how to interpret the information and have a little bit of a deeper dive. We're hoping that our IFR course will be available by this summer. And in our scope is the development of a UAS weather course similar to what we're doing with VFR and IFR. However, the problem is that what are we going to teach them? because we don't know what the information is that's gonna be available. So going beyond the basics, we're not quite sure where to take it. How do we create a checklist, especially if we're using different tiers? What's appropriate for which operation uh, based on the risk level, they will need different kinds of information. So those are definitely things that are still, that are in the scope, at least for flight service. There's just a little bit more work that needs to be done before we get there. So, Thanks, uh, Frankie. So if I could make a shameless plug for FAAsafety.gov, go log on. This course that all of you developed out of, I guess, out of the AC or after the AC or with the AC, um, it's a great course. It really is. It's interactive. Um, it's informative. It's easy. It's free. <laughs> Free is, is always good. People will, will do something that's free, and it's a great course, and I look forward to the IFR course. But, so, uh, you know, maybe you start with some basics, and as um, weather develops, as, as 
as we mature in our low level weather, you add on to it? So ch check with the military. I mean, the Air Force has an excellent weather for air crews manual and a weather for air crews course. And there's also a specific course designed only for drone pilots. So all that stuff exists. And, uh, you know, and of course, what we experienced over time, when you train an aviator who actually flies, <clears throat> They can apply what they learn because they're in the airplane, they're flying through the weather, they feel the airplane move. Uh, RPA pilots don't have that same experience. And so there is a big difference. Uh, and so they need more help, more education and, and training to go along with that. But certainly the military has very, very good courses. Go ahead. Uh, so uh, just one comment, Marilyn. I, you know, I've heard for years this, um, this comment about, well, you can, you can miss all the weather questions and still pass the test. Now, it's my experience, though, that almost all the weather questions on the exam are stupid. There are questions like, how do you read a METAR, a coded METAR? How do you read a TAF? You know, how do you take the gobbledygook language that weather has been disseminated in and turn it into something that you can understand? Now, that's not a relevant skill because you don't need that skill in today's world you can get on the uh, on the the uh, new website at uh, AWC and you get the translated METAR translated TAF translated everything so really the questions that they ought to put on are relevant questions about how do you deal with weather how do you make a decision you know what are the criteria Absolutely. I think as we maybe mature a bit, we get performance-based type questions. You're flying from here and the weather is such, and you hear that something, you know, you hear a pie rep and it says this, you know, what are you going to do to alter your course or do you need to alter? I mean, something relevant to how are you interpreting weather, I agree. Um, but I can say that I worked in the division that kind of works on, you know, commercial pilots and, and the the pilot testing and so forth, it's very difficult to change a PTS or an ACS or rewrite. It's a long process. It's the government. What can I say? But yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are better questions that maybe would lead to um, students not failing weather questions when maybe you're given a TAF and they say, you know, for the weather at such and such a time, it's going to be what? And you have A, B, and C, and you know, you've got to read this whole long task to figure it all out. Is that a, an accurate measure of your knowledge when you could really go and just read it? You know, trend, when it's translated for you in, in real time online? I don't know. Um, okay. So this is a good discussion. I need to move us on to the last subject of the day. And this is where we're gonna talk about where we are with performance standards. So uh, Don, you have 14 minutes uh, and I will take my five minutes of wrap up and do it in 30 seconds. So I will grant you the majority of time that's left available in the session. Over to you. Yeah, thanks Ralph. Um, you know, one I wanna make one comment on the training and I think Bruce, you hit it right on the head. I, I've taught several of those Part 107 train courses, and um, the weather training training in those courses are pretty much irrelevant to drone pilots, um, and that's part of the you know that's part of the problem. I you know why don't we have a micro weather section in there? Why don't we talk about you know how fog forms in little valleys, and when you're flying over a ridge, you might run into that, and you need to be aware of that though that's what i think is missing in in the training is that it's not realistic to what they what they experience so uh anyway that was my comment just to support bruce's uh what he was saying um in terms of uh yeah what we're doing with standards so you've heard a lot about this today um and i think you know just to summarize it in, in a nutshell you know what what is really trying to be done here is to take you know, we're really trying to change the way aviation weather is, is collected, take advantage of this opportunity where we have this new industry that has a much 
define a requirement for granular weather information ubiquitously and you know look at think about why we have the rules we have today right we certified instruments because back in the 1940s and 50s you know that's what you did right the technology was was not as uh, capable as it is today you have to have standards you had to build these capabilities it's like the TAF code and the METAR code. Why do we have TAF code and METAR code? You think, you know, there's a bunch of folks that sat around and go, let's try to make this observation as hard as it is to read for somebody. No, it's because you had limited bandwidth to move communications. That was the whole reason that you coded it like that. All the reasons why we do things today are no longer the reasons we have to continue doing them, right? So we need to think that same way when it comes to this, uh, this entity uh, of, air, of of this new industry, or I should say, this evolution of the aviation industry into uh, uncrewed aircraft. So the the way we looked at the data and the and the data providers and the supplemental data providers is first we looked at, you know, what is what's UTM doing, what's NASA doing, what is FAA doing in terms of other areas where there's data requirements, not weather data, but you know the FAA has decided that they're going to federate. Uh, the responsibility, I shouldn't say responsibility,